So, and being cognizant of the idea that that development 21, 17 years later, <laughs> Who's grapes? Grapes earlier? Being a smarty pants. I thought so. I figured I'd check. No, it's important. Check. Keep your grapes. Pick one tea. Back. How are you? The online. Okay. Is everyone settled in? One more chair. All right, so we could get on with the actual council meeting. So resolve in the committee the whole recommendation of council resolve itself and the committee of the whole at uh, three minutes after five. Councillor Aries, seconded by Councillor Evans, all in favor. Okay, so we have a delegation online, Shoe Shop Tourism, Kyle Deering. Kyle, are you online? Can we hear you? And um, looking forward to uh, your presentation. Um, can you guys hear us? We can't hear anybody on your end, but it looks like maybe my screen is being shared. Can you hear us now? Hello, hello. We connected. No, oh, it doesn't quite close. Well, it's just because I got a cord in there right now. Here, should I try to log in? Um, Maybe. Are hooked up. Open it, I can't. You guys can hear us. So. <clears throat> the speaker. So the. The link. Recording in progress. Hi everyone, uh, Kyle and Stephanie here from Shoeswap Tourism. We're just having some issues with the setup in the, the meeting room that we're um, connected to, but I'm logged in on my own computer now, uh, checking to see if you can hear us okay. Hear you. All right, Kyle, introduce yourself and uh, who you represent and uh, council is willing to hear your presentation and we have about uh, 10 or 12 people in the gallery as well. So uh, you have the floor, sir, go ahead. That's great. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to, we're gonna 
quickly um, uh, move things around here. I'm going to share my screen. Oh, uh, it says, it, or actually, can you see our screen at the moment? No, we cannot see your screen. Carl, okay. can you turn it so, off from your side? So what we'll do is, Stephanie, if you can just uh, quit um, uh, and log out of Zoom um, on your computer. Um, if, if whoever is in charge of the computer, if, um, oh, if you can let one of us share our screens, that would be great. Yeah, like if they let me share. Yeah, if they let me share, it should work. What? Under settings, you can take pictures with the TV. I think it's not easy. Audio. I mean, they can hear us now. I can't hear him very well. Or even the logic headphones, actually. Let me see. Okay. Yep, I do. Okay, so we're going to exit out of um, the meeting from the computer we were trying to use entirely. And now, um, uh, oh, and it looks like I've been given uh, sharing rights. So just give me a second to get the presentation up on my computer. That's good. That's good. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Sorry for this hiccup, you guys. Thank you. Got it under control here now. We can hear you, so go ahead, Kyle. Well, you're showing off. I, I hope that we've got it under control here as well. So, uh, okay. Can everybody see um, our uh, first slide, which has a photo um, of two people on the Sycamus lookout with Sycamus Council presentation on the bottom left hand side? Is that what you guys are seeing? On your screens? Yes. Perfect. Okay. So what I'm also going to do is um, uh, actually, please let us know if there's any issues with uh, with sound because if there are, I will stop sharing the video. But for the time being, we'll we'll keep it on here. Um, bear with me just as I reorganize my screen. Um, so thank you everybody for your patience. Um, and good evening. Uh, my name is Kyle Beering. I'm the acting manager of Shootswap Tourism. I'm joined by Stephanie Goody, uh, who is Shootswap Tourism's marketing coordinator. And we both held these positions for um, about two and a half years or so at this point. Uh, we were asked to provide an overview of Shootswap Tourism's function and an ongoing work. So we thought we would start with a general overview of who we are and then share a summary of some of the major projects we've undertaken this year to give you a sense of what we do um, and how we represent the Shootswap region. Um, and then we'll finish off with an overview of what our plans look like so far for 2022. And you might notice that we're largely scripted today. And that's simply because we have so much information to share that if we don't stick to our notes, uh, it's very easy for us to digress and end up doubling the length of this presentation because we have so many interesting projects to share. So um, please bear with us as we uh, try to save us from ourselves, save you from ourselves. And so we'll start with who we are. Um, we're the Regional Destination Marketing Organization, or DMO, for the Shoe Swap region uh, that is comp comprised of eight communities or areas. And so that means that our principal mandate is to attract visitors to our region and to support them in their travel planning activities. Uh, we get our core funding from local government tax, age, tax requisition, and we leverage or add to those funds with various grants from organizations like Destination BC and the Thompson Okanagan Tourism Association. Much of Shoesoft Tourism's work is guided by our current five-year strategic marketing plan. The guiding principle of this plan is that we're already strong in summer months, so let's make it our goal to evolve Shoesoft into a four-season destination. And so as you can see, the timeline of experience promotion is heavily weighted um, in favor of shoulder and off-season activities. Right. So Shushwap Tourism is primarily focused on visitor attraction. We do this through a variety of marketing activities that include digital marketing campaigns, print ads, and editorial content, social media engagement, website promotion, fam tours with media outlets and trade shows, and event attendance. One of the things we've accomplished over the last two years is we recognize we had access to an amazing amount of data from sources like TELUS and TOTUS Community Research Program that shows us where target market is, where they live, and how to attract. Are we 
attract attention and engage with them. Based on that, we've worked with our marketing and digital ad agencies to create a framework where both the development of our campaign assets and our campaign execution are very data-driven. That means our ad is developed to appeal to, a to appeal to the target market we're trying to attract, and our campaigns are then geo-targeted to specific postal codes where we know large segments of those target markets are located and shown on the digital platforms we know they are most likely to use. As we'll touch on in a minute, COVID has required us to take a bit of a broader perspective on this. So we can ensure we're developing assets that can have an appeal across multiple markets, depending on who we may be able to promote ourselves to. But the underlying principle has still really helped us to focus our efforts and our outputs. Once our marketing campaigns have attracted desert interest, we also maintain a suite of print materials, as well as a very comprehensive website to help support extensive research and trip planning activities spanning throughout our region. And so our region has evolved very quickly over the past few years to having various new players participating in tourism marketing activities. Uh, both yourselves and Salmon Arm have community-based DMOs supported through MRDT collection. And we've also seen various chambers of commerce take a more active role in promoting their communities to visitors as well. Um, and so this has been something that's flagged, been flagged for future um, exploration and, and strategic planning um, to ensure that we're all aligning our efforts and branding where appropriate and also to avoid duplication or conflicting messages. Um, in the meantime, we thought it'd be useful to share this graphic with you to illustrate how different levels of destination marketing activities fit together from the local to the national level. Um, and so you'll see that starting at the community level, there's a hierarchy where we all feed into a bigger picture that goes all the way up to Destination Canada. And so the idea here is that we all have different geographic boundaries. And for you, it's Sycamus. For Shoe Swap Tourism, it's the whole Shoe Swap region. Um, and we also have different areas of focus with our marketing efforts. Typically, regional DMOs like us focus on closer markets like Western Canada and the Pacific Northwest in the US because our marketing budgets can only stretch so far. And then we rely on larger TODA, DDC, and Destination Canada organizations to incorporate us into larger national and international marketing efforts. And so this is why us aligning with them and working with them on an ongoing basis is so important and valuable to us. Um, so the idea here is for us all to be aligning our messaging and assets with each other and the larger players so they can be of use to our individual organizations, uh, um, as well as resources that these other groups can use um, because they all have the, look, the same look and feel and align um, as they work their way up that pyramid there. Um, and so for Shoe Swap Tourism's part, we underwent a brand refresh last year to ensure we're appropriately aligned uh, with BBC and Destination Canada. Um, and even the main photographer that we use has gone through specific BBC training uh, to ensure our imagery aligns with BBCs. And so the other point here um, is that there's lots of ways that we can support and promote Sycamus. Uh, but Sycamus can also support us by ensuring that your messaging and assets are aligned with us um, so we can use them as marketing tools in our own toolbox and share up that chain as well. And so before we dive into sharing some of our 2021 highlights, we thought we'd start by providing a quick overview of how Chuseop Tourism has responded to COVID-19. Um, basically, all of our projects and marketing campaigns over the past 18 months have been affected by the pandemic and travel restrictions. And so rather than getting bogged down explaining how we've tailored or adapted each initiative, we thought we'd give you our big picture overview and framework. Um, and so Shoe Swap Tourism was a founding member of the Shoe Swap Regional Economic Recovery Task Force and Economic Recovery Plan and the supports and resources that have been born out of that process. Um, based on the needs and opportunities identified as part of the process, uh, many of the projects and marketing resources that Shoe Swap Tourism has developed since COVID-19 became a reality for us all have been designed around appealing to a wide range of audiences from local to our various other potential target markets. So we have assets that we can use to support and promote our region based on whatever the travel restrictions may have been at the time. And so we've also developed various messaging resources and digital assets for our local tourism operators and other stakeholders to be able to use in their own communication efforts as well. And so in times where we weren't able to promote visitation, we also pivoted to promoting our tourism assets and, and operators to our local communities in an effort to encourage locals to support our tourism businesses and embrace that staycation idea um, when and where possible. And so from the very beginning of the pandemic, Destination BC has also taken a very strong lead in providing communications guidance and support to DMOs across the province. Shoe Swap Tourism has followed this guidance and tailored it to our own brand and messaging where appropriate. 
Um, and DVC continues to be very proactive in moving uh, funding timelines around based on travel restrictions and also providing several funding top ups to help further support our work. And they continue to be a very strong supporter and an excellent resource for our tourism industry as we all work towards coming out uh, the other side of this pandemic. And so let's dive into what we've been up to in 2021. And so based on our experience in 2020, we went into 2021 knowing that we needed to build a large degree of flexibility into all of our projects and marketing campaigns, recognizing the high level of uncertainty we continue to face regarding COVID travel restrictions, and more recently, the wildfire situation that we all experienced this past summer. And so uh, to start out, uh, based on our strategic marketing plan, last year was supposed to be all about trails promotion. Uh, Shoe Swap Tourism typically works with its marketing agency to develop campaigns based around our strategic marketing plan. So with all the uncertainties um, around who and when we could promote ourselves to and knowing that we'd likely need to be able to pivot to different markets at different times, we challenged them to develop an overall campaign concept that would serve us well in trails promotion, but that we could also use as an umbrella for various other campaigns as we navigated through COVID and came out on the other side. And so out of this, the Shoe Swap Originals campaign concept was developed, embracing that social distancing and traveling within family bubbles would likely be some kind of reality for at least the short term and positioning ourselves as a place that mastered all the things the world now demands. So the original masters of connection, remote everything, quality time, etc. cetera. Um, and we've used this, uh, this concept in a few ways so far, and we'll share a few examples with you as we continue through this presentation. Um, this campaign was to go to market in early fall last year, but based on travel restrictions and DDC funding restrictions at that time, we made the decision uh, in consultation with our marketing and digital ad agencies to hold off on the major campaign spend until we were in a position to promote visitation and welcome visitors back. And so we ended up launching the campaign in late spring 2021 to coincide with travel restrictions being reduced. And it ran quite successfully until we had to pause again due to our local wildfire challenges over the summer. Um, we resumed again in September and had it run until last week uh, when we replaced it with a more fall oriented campaign that we'll share more about in a couple of minutes. And so I think, um, so, so we've got, uh, is it two stuff? Yes. So we've got two videos from that trails campaign that we'll show to you now. Um, and we've had some, we, we think we've, we've overcome the, the bugs in playing this clearly over Zoom, but um, if you find that it's not working properly, please speak up and we won't uh, waste your time um, if they're not playing properly. that is most valuable to us as we work to promote our region is having resources that we can share. With that in mind, we've worked with several local writers to create blog and article series that highlight various activities and experiences throughout our region. The written content really helps to add another layer of meat to our visitor attraction resources and also has great resources for other stakeholders and operators to be using and sharing. They also help to maintain and increase our overall search engine optimization. Having an up-to-date and eye-catching photo and video asset is really important to the component of destination marketing. So as we have, so we have also worked with our photographer throughout the year to be, sorry, uh, throughout this year to both update and also help fill in some holes in our overall suite of energy. Victoria Hack has been an incredible partner with us. And as mentioned earlier, she's actually undergone specific training with DVC to be able to support us in aligning with DVC. Um, we also continue our participation in the BC Ale Trail for 2021. The shoe swap is part of the Inferior Trail that includes Kamloops, Vernon, and Merritt. And we get a variety of benefits from this, including shoe swap specific photo and video assets and being included in various campaigns tied to our larger Inferior region. Right now, we have plans to have Ale Trail photographers capture a couple of our new brewery businesses in the shoe swap. And the Ale Trail also has a couple of fall campaigns that are in the process of being launched. 
We also have a group of social media influencers that traveled through the region last week and they posted all of their um, visits on social media last week, which you can go and check out on our Instagram if you're interested. I know that Sycamus doesn't have a brewery at the moment, but we've also been in discussion with the Ale Trail regarding how we might be able to incorporate other liquor producers like distilleries and cideries in the future. So we'll continue to keep you guys up to date on that. Uh, each year, we also work with the championship golf courses in the region to sell the golf, shoe shop golf trail pass and also engage in various other marketing and promotional activities. We typically receive separate DVC funding specific to our shoe shop golf consortium, and we received an additional top up this year. So we are currently working with the golf courses to explore an opportunity for creating a new shoe shop microsite, as well as some other golf specific marketing collateral. Uh, we've also partnered with Tourism Revelstoke and Tourism Golden to develop and launch a Get into BC microsite that provides information and resources regarding the Highway 1 construction closures taking place east of Golden at the moment. A link to the microsite pops up on all three of our website's homepages to draw visitors' attention to this information. We also updated our suite of print materials earlier this year and have been in an ongoing pattern of distribution throughout the region. So visitor centers and operators are always stocked. As many of you know, Shoe Shop Tourism also provide, produces an annual vacation guide. This guide is funded through sales. And as we looked at what we could do for 2021, we recognized that many of our traditional advertisers in our region didn't have the funds to commit to purchasing ad space. So because there were only a few specific references to 2020 in our 2020 vacation guide, we made the decision to repurpose it for 2021. We had a sticker developed that goes over the 2020 part of the vacation guide and then wraps around the inside page that explains that the guide has been repurposed and provides a call to action for people to visit the website for updated information. This is typically the time of year where we begin working on next year's vacation guide. And last month, we surveyed our tourism operators to confirm there was an appetite to continue producing the guide annually through selling ad space. And we were happy to see the majority of respondents were supportive and interested in purchasing ad space. So we're currently working on that with our graphic designer um, to refresh the overall appearance and have it ready for distribution in early 2022. Okay, and oh, and sorry, I was supposed to advance the slide. That's the current uh, proof of what the cover for our 2022 vacation guide looks like. Uh, moving on, um, again, based around our Shoe Shop Originals campaign umbrella, we received some additional funding from BBC earlier this year um, that had to be used very quickly, but they couldn't be used to promote visitation at that time um, because of the travel restrictions that were in place. And so we went back to our marketing agency and worked with them to create additional video and photo assets that could be used as part of a reconnecting with family campaign. Um, and again, this was developed based on the data we had and what we know about our target markets. Um, and we actually just launched this campaign this week um, with the plan to have it run until early November, at which point we'll switch over until uh, to more winter oriented content. And so next uh, we'll play you that, um, that video that we have in market right now. The shoe shop is always the place we go for our family holidays. It is just so naturally beautiful and breathtaking that instantly you're just drawn to this area. It's just so calming and there's so many amazing places to enjoy outdoors here. Watching my two kids share in all these special memories and moments here on the shoe spot with my parents has been something so special and something I'll hold very close to my heart. Coming from a really young age, we were learning to ride our bikes, so we'd come to the wharf here in Salmon Arm, and then we'd always head to DeMille's to go visit and feed the animals, and we absolutely love to get outdoors hiking. So now to be able to come here and go to all those places that bring back those memories and share those moments with my own kids and my parents, it's, it's just a very, very special place. Okay, and so another fun video project that we got to do this year. Um, we're very lucky to have some amazing photographers and videographers in our larger region. And one of the agencies that we've done a lot, quite a lot of work with to develop a few different video campaigns basically rose to social media fame last year by creating ad content for various well-known businesses, um, some of which were owned by celebrities um, while we were in lockdown in a series they called Ad Salation. 
And so this attracted attention um, from various other celebrities and large businesses and led to a very strong follower and engagement numbers um, for their video production business. And so this year, Shoe Slop Tourism was offered an opportunity to be featured in one of their ad selection ads. Um, and we worked with them to develop an itinerary and storyline that featured experiencing a shoe swap in 24 hours. And we also put together a prize package that was included with the video release last week. Um, and so far that video has had over 10,000 views and over 1,500 people entered the prize draw. Um, the other benefit working with these guys is that while they were making um, this video, they also shared various behind the scenes uh, content and promoted the locations they were filming in uh, to their 33,000 plus followers. And so we'll play the video in a second, but you'll see that um, um, Sick Moose was highlighted in this video as well as the other videos we've shown today. And this is an example of how we work with Carly and the Sick Moose Ekdev Corp, um, basically on an ongoing basis to ensure there is a range of Sick Moose assets being featured whenever possible. We gave ourselves 24 hours to experience the best the shoe swap has to offer. And here's how it went. You can't come to the shoe swap without stopping at Demel's. So we are here to get some snacks, we are here to hang out with the animals, and then we are on our way to Margaret Falls. Let's go. Okay, we got the good. Now off to the local waterfall. Sam is apple good. Quick drive down Sunny Bay Road. Now we're gonna take a walk through this beautiful forest to Margaret Falls. Dad mode activated. It is M's first time seeing a waterfall. We made it to Harold's Provincial Park and we've got this beautiful charcuterie board thanks to our friends at DeMille's. We've got lots of local like crackers, some uh, wine grapes. And uh, yeah, we're going to enjoy. Best way to finish off a day of adventure is cider and pizza. So we are here at Shoe Swap Cider Company to get two of my favorite things in the world. Pizza, pizza. That is a wrap on day one. And now we're going to head back to the hotel, check in, get some rest, and do it all again tomorrow. Six fifty in the morning. We're gonna go check out the sunrise. I'm not traditionally a pie guy, but every time I come to the shoe shop, I have to go here because they have vegan pie crust. They make blueberry, strawberry, rhubarb, meat pies, vegan pies, every type of pie you can think of, and they are absolutely incredible. You cannot miss this place. Let's eat. Okay, so we're here at Hyde Mountain. I'm about to take my first drive of the season. This might be the nicest tea box I've ever been on, so. Let's hope the drive's just as nice. Wish me luck. <laughs> Buckle up, we're going on a bike ride. Loose Mulligan! Last stop on a 24 hour journey is After Dark Distillery. We're gonna go suck down some sick moose spirits. <laughs> <laughs> Is platinum better than gold? Mm. Platinum. <laughs> okay, and so next, uh, just to touch on our plans for this coming winter, um, and going back to the experience timeline from our five-year marketing strategy, we have a lot of photo and video assets that were created during, during years one and year two uh, that feature winter activities in our region. And we're working on repurposing this content now um, and plan to run a winter campaign with these assets starting in November and lasting into the new year.
Uh, we can continue to see a really strong engagement and growth on our social media feeds. This is due in large part to having updated and relevant photo, video, and written content that we can share. We have a content calendar that highlights various experiences, events, and other activities based on season and continue to push out content as consistently as possible. Okay, and so now we'll get into plans for 2022. And as I'm sure you're all aware, um, Shoe Stop Tourism is in the process of going through a significant transition at the moment. Um, and this timing right now is a little bit ahead of when we would traditionally plan out next year's projects in detail, but we've done our best um, to summarize everything that we know we will be moving forward with so far um, to give you a sense of what next year will look like for us. Um, there's also going to be a new manager starting soon, and so we also want to leave room for them to be able to participate in this 2022 planning as well. Um, and so, as always, we're very excited to explore opportunities for collaboration on these projects with Carly and your Ectep Corp. Um, but we're also very happy to support Sycamus in visitor attraction projects you choose to undertake as well. Um, as long as we can be properly aligned in aesthetics and messaging, uh, Shoe Swap Tourism can help to amplify initiatives and projects your organized, your Active Corp uh, chooses to take on as well. Um, and the more you do to create marketing information resources specific to Sycamus um, that follows this alignment, the more tools we have to help promote Sycamus as well. Um, and so in addition to this, there are also various projects and other partnerships we enter into where we are representing Sycamus, uh, usually along with various other communities in the shoe swap as well. Um, and in these cases, we always try to reach out to Carly um, and your Ectep Corp um, for input and guidance as well, just to make sure that we're representing and promoting Sycamus as best and as relevant as we possibly can. And so to start on the top of the list, organizational planning, um, as I said a minute ago, Shoe Swap Tourism has been in a transition since uh, the previous manager vacated the position mid-2019. The plan was to fill this position immediately, but there have been several developments that have slowed down this process. Um, in the meantime, and as I touched on earlier, the tourism marketing landscape in our region has evolved dramatically. We now have both Salmon Arm and Sycamus operating community-based BMOs, um, and we have chambers of commerce and other stakeholders who are also taking a more active role in tourism marketing as well. And so in addition to creating an internal organizational strategy for Shoe Swap Tourism, um, time also needs to be spent examining how these stakeholders and partners can best work together and how Shoe Swap Tourism can best support this work and encourage that strategic alignment. And so next, vacation planner, as Steph mentioned earlier, this is typically the time of the year where we begin working on next year's vacation guide. Last month, we surveyed our tourism operators to confirm there was an appetite to continue producing this guide annually through selling ad space. And we were happy to see that the majority of respondents were supportive. Uh, so we're currently working with our graphic designer to refresh the overall appearance of the guide. And we will be starting to sell ad space soon so we can have the guide ready for distribution in very early 2022. Uh, next, other print resources. Again, as Steph touched on earlier, Shoe Swap Tourism has a large suite of print resources that cover a lot of different visitor experiences. Um, every year, there are minor edits needed in at least some of these materials, and most need to be reprinted, so we have enough supplies to last us through the year. Um, and so we're working through this um, and plan to continue to work through it into early 2022, um, so things can all be printed and ready for distribution in very early 2022, um, as is usual. Um, and so this and the vacation guide development I just mentioned, uh, they're both something we check in with all the different communities and areas to ensure um, information and messaging is accurate and representative. And so this is another example of uh, how we work with Carly on a regular basis to make sure we're properly representing Sycamus and the information is all up to date. Uh, Salmon Run campaign. And so bear with me, this gets a little bit confusing. confusing. Um, we showed you the experience timeline from our five-year marketing plan in an earlier slide. Um, year four, which was this year, was intended to be all about fishing, and next year was intended to align with the major salmon run event on the Adams River. Because of COVID-related delays on when we could launch last year's trails campaign, we ended up with essentially a backlog of campaigns and developed assets leading into this year. And so very long story short, and in consultation with our marketing agency, um, who were the ones who developed our five-year marketing plan, um, it was recommended that we essentially stretch our trails marketing focus over two years, last year and this year, instead of one, and then move on to year four of our marketing plan in 2022. 
The other complication to this is that we can't change the major salmon run event that will take place next year. So we've also flipped years four and year five. So next year we'll focus on the salmon run and the year after we'll focus on fishing. And the salmon run is a major international event. And although it's not in Sycamus, there are lots of opportunities to encourage visitors to explore other areas of the shoe swap um, while they're here. And so we look forward to exploring creative ways with Carly and other partners from other areas of the shoe swap to ensure we realize that opportunity. And I also remember the last major salmon run event and how people were filling up hotels in Sycamus because everywhere closer to the salmon run was full. And so this really is something that benefits operators throughout the region and something that, that we really look forward to capitalizing on um, next year as well. And so uh, next writing series, as we mentioned earlier, having a supply of great written content and stories that showcase our region gives us another a way to highlight various aspects of the visitor experience and gives us an additional layer of meat to entice prospective visitors. Uh, we typically arrange this content um, so it's developed as part of a series where different areas of the shoe swap are highlighted individually. So stakeholders in each area end up with assets specifically relevant to them that they can post or reference as well. And so posting content like this helps significantly in our website search engine optimization as well. And that's something that we're always trying to ensure is as high as possible. So when people search for information on the shoe swap and, and traveling here, we, we show up at the top of the list. And this is another example where we reach out to Carly and representatives from other communities in our region uh, to work with us to develop this content and make sure that it's as relevant and informative as possible. Photo and video asset updates, same thing. We're also constantly in need of new imagery and video representing a greater diversity of assets and experiences throughout the region, uh, both for our own use and to be able to share with other organizations. Uh, we're not sure exactly what this will look like yet for 2022 in terms of what we focus on for, for asset development, um, but there will likely be a few different opportunities for us to do this over the course of the year, and so we, we look forward to working with uh, your Active Corp and Carly um, wherever possible on that one. Um, and, and like I just said, when we do this, we, we check in with stakeholders in areas we're shooting in to see what imagery they may need so we can try to incorporate those needs into our shot list as well. Um, and so moving on, BC Ale Trail, uh, as mentioned earlier, the BC Ale Trail is a great way for us to tie into craft beer marketing at the provincial level. So we'll be partnering with this again. As Steph mentioned, we're also working with them to see if we can expand the Ale Trail to include um, uh, cideries and, and other liquor producers. And so look forward to seeing how we can break that from our region as we move forward as well. Shoe Swap Golf Consortium, we've had great success promoting the Shoe Swap Golf Trail past and running golf specific marketing campaigns and trade shows in the past. And so we look forward to continuing these efforts next year. And a lot of the golf courses in our region have brought in new managers over the past year or two. And there's really a refreshed energy and interest in working together. And we're really excited about that. Um, and we actually typically get a separate DBC grant specific to um, the Shoe Swap Golf Trail. And so we'll be working on that application later this year once that application is available. Uh, the Get Into BC microsite, uh, we'll continue to be part of this partnership with Tourism Revelstoke and Tourism Golden as long as the highway construction and closures are taking place. Uh, this is actually another separate DVC grant that allowed us to both build the microsite and launch a marketing campaign this year. And now that the site is built, we will continue to up <coughs> um, put, put most of our efforts um, and resources into a marketing campaign in the Alberta East markets um, to encourage them still to come. Uh, Sledge Shoe Swap, we started this project this year, but ended up deciding to push some of the work into 2022. The end result will be a microsite that highlights sledding opportunities in the Shoe Swap region, um, as well as the corresponding marketing campaign. And so this is something that we partnered with both uh, Sycamus and Salmon Arms MRDT organizations on as well. And in these instances where we partner with our MRDT organizations financially, the idea is that both Sycamus and Salmon Arm each get a third of the overall exposure and focus, and then Shusop Tourism represents the other third for the rest of the region. Uh, repurposing existing campaign assets, at, like we mentioned earlier with the winter campaign assets, we've got a, really, a lot of really great uh, assets from previous years that are still very relevant. And so we will be running various campaigns using these throughout next year as well. Uh, FAM Tour attraction, um, 
FAM tour means familiarization tour. And this is something that has been relatively quiet for the past year due to COVID. But typically we work with Destination DC and the Thompson Okanagan Tourism Association and other larger provincial and national stakeholders to attract and host media um, familiarization tours through our region. Um, we're already seeing interest start to pick up again. And so we look forward to growing this back to where we were pre-pandemic. And usually this involves creating an itinerary of experiences to highlight our area. And this is something else that we work with partners like your ECDEV Corp on to develop and execute um, every time this opportunity comes up. And we're actually working with BBC right now to host a writer from the Globe and Mail who's coming later this month uh, to do a story on the Salmon Run in preparation for next year's major event. Uh, work with BBC and TODA, and so this is something that we're that's always ongoing. Um, just like you guys aligning your assets and messaging with us, we align with both BBC and TODA, and that makes it easier and more likely for them to be able to amplify our products and incorporate our region into their larger marketing and promotional activities. Social media, again, as we mentioned earlier, this is something we focused on for the last couple of years to really build a strong following and increase engagement numbers so our messaging can be amplified and seen by as many people as possible. And so this helps in increasing and maintaining awareness and interest in our region. And it's something that we will continue to work towards growing um, uh, year after year. And lastly, uh, the, our website. Uh, so when Steph and I took on these positions in mid-2019, um, she saw tourism was already midway through having a new website built. And I won't bog us down with the details here, but there were some significant challenges with how the new site was designed and built that we've made a lot of progress on, but we're still working to overcome. Um, and so one of the challenges is getting as many businesses as possible to create listings on the site. And it's something that we're continually working on and something we've been very thankful to our partners and stakeholders throughout the region in sharing this messaging and encouraging their business communities to contact us so that we can create those listings for them. And so this will continue to be a strong focus in 2022. And while we're talking about our website, I know there was an issue this summer where boat launchers weren't properly populating for Sycamus. And this is a bit complicated to explain as well, but the short version is that our website pulls boat launch information from two different sources. Uh, one is the CSRD public boat launches database, and the other is from private businesses that have a listing on our site who've said that they have a boat launch as part of their, their business. And so we've sorted out the glitch now with public boat launches, and as more businesses with private boat launches get their own listings on our website, they will also start to show up on that list. And the reality with the website for us is that we're a staff of two um, and the website has several hundred pages and we don't have the capacity to monitor every sub page all the time. And so please, if you ever see there's any glitch taking place, uh, let us know immediately and we will always do our best to get things fixed or updated as quickly as possible. All right, and then so lastly, we have a new industry resource page that we've created this summer. Um, and so the purpose of this page is to provide industry with any resources that they may need. Um, so we have right now, we have some industry tools, um, a way to request guides for your business, um, the Crowdrift Media Hub, where you can get some of our images, um, how to get listed, any kind of information we think that a business may need, we have that here. So that's a good resource for you and we will keep it up to date um, with information as we get that. And that's it for us. Um, very happy to answer any questions that anybody may have. All right, thanks, Kyle. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, that is quite a presentation. Uh, I think that uh, there's a lot of deliverables in there. Uh, so I'll open up the floor right now. Uh, the one person I hope that's online, Carly, I would like to have your take on your relationship now with Shoe Swap Tourism. Are you available online? Uh, if you are. Um... Yes, I'm here. Okay, Carly, uh, you're now working directly with Shoe Swap Tourism with Stephanie and Kyle. And um, uh, we've had to kind of change our thinking a little bit. Uh, I see the deliverables are certainly uh, been uh, laid out for us. Uh, I think that um, where the compromise was uh, at one stage, uh, we didn't feel that we were getting a bang for our buck when it comes to shoe shop tourism, but I see that that's somewhat turned around. Carly, your take, please. Um, no, I think that as mentioned before, uh, my relationship with Stephanie and Kyle has been very collaborative um, as evident by the 
ad salation project and other programming, uh, you know, everything does take time. So we've um, established a back and forth relationship where I'm making my plans to align with Shishwa Purism plans to better amplify Sikhanus' position within that hierarchy that they showed. So uh, there's a greater chance of our specific assets being uh, pushed out and up leveled through those organizations above Shusha Prism, such as Destination BC, TOTA, and up to Destination Canada. So, no, I think it's really good. I'm excited to continue working with them on our 2022 plans to make sure everything aligns. Um, that's all I have to say. Thank you guys. Oh, uh, one more thing. Sorry. They did present to our Tourism Advisory Committee, and uh, everyone was really excited to also start to um, input their information and collaborate that way as well. Thank you. Yeah, well, I thought for a while that uh, both Kyle and Stephanie were going to completely take over our council meeting tonight with that presentation. <laughs> but anyway, I'm going to open up the floor to councillors if they have any comments or questions at this particular stage. Comments or questions from councillors? Wow, I'm hearing none. Oh, go ahead, Councillor Evans. Thank you, through the Chair. Thanks for the good Sukumos commercial. <laughs> My pleasure. <laughs> A very good presentation and thank you both and um, we look forward to working with you in the future so thank you Carly thank you Kyle and thank you Stephanie and uh, and uh, we'll carry on thank you thanks for the opportunity all right that was interesting okay moving on then to uh, five administration update, capital projects update. Uh, Daryl, could you give us a rundown on this, please? Well, I'm there if it works. Well, that's a public acronym, isn't it? That's awesome. <laughs> Let me do a little virtual tour today. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, so we've got a lot of things going on, a lot of projects going on right now, and nothing That's goes funny. quite as quickly as you know. <laughs> uh, we're making progress. Beach Park upgrades. Yeah. We had yeah. some challenges with the two to one slopes on the side, near the, near the front, near the, the waterfront side. Uh, we've dressed those with some big, some big rocks and big, big boulders. It was the most affordable way to handle that steep slope. And we've got some shrubs planted along the top and uh, they'll, they'll be kind of thorny and barby and, and keep kids from jumping through and, and uh, keep people safe. So bathroom fixtures are installed. The pergola is delivered now. Installation should be in the next week or two. Uh, and we've got a playground to upgrade the playground as well. So that and the trail enhancements are, are still coming. And we'll just see if we can share some pictures. Oh. Was that me or? Yep. Okay. Okay, so that's what it looks like now if you haven't got down there in a while. We've got a nice rolling cage there for the concession. Uh, the doors are in, lights are working. Uh, we've got some, some nice little touches around the outside, a little family bathroom on the inside. I just keep it right out. I need to share it. People can't see it. Okay. That's a little family bathroom, change room. Uh, bathrooms are all but complete now. Concession on the insides come along really well. They've done the water park re-plumbing. Water's running. A little shower on the outside. And there's the rocks. We have those on both sides with the with the shrubs. This is all prepped for sod. The sod showed up today and they started. So that'll, that'll be done by the end of the week. Uh, the wastewater treatment plant works to date. We started just to refresh real quick. We uh, we started this a couple of years ago. We went into Lagoon 1 in the truck waste lagoon and we did de sludge those. Then we got some aeration in Lagoon 1. We got another blower and more diffusers because air was a big problem in Lagoon 1. We put a screening room in for the influent, to take the materials out so we wouldn't have to be sludge as often. Uh, truck waste offloading system was installed. There's still some mechanical challenges with that. So a little asterisk beside that one. We're gonna need some mechanical work to get that running like it should. Uh, we've this year put a baffle in, in Lagoon One to divert all the 
influent into the middle of the air, so it, it works uh, a lot more efficiently. And I should know what's behind there, but I there we go. And we're in the filter. The filter installation is underway now. That's it there. 7,000 feet of rebar on the bottom slab, 6,200 feet of rebar on the walls. Walls, uh, this was a couple of days ago. All the walls are in place now and they'll be pouring probably tomorrow. It's okay. There. So yeah, it's it's uh, it's an engineering marvel. <laughs> you ever get attacked by air? That's where you want to be. Uh, the healing center. So so we've got the announcement of to remain. We've got some signage in place. That will be put out soon. Uh, Main Street revitalization. We did submit the, the beautification grant, BC Hydro. That was September third. They're going to get some costs back to us for getting hydro underground. That'll be by the end of the month. And then we'll be coming back to you for a council resolution by the end of November. We're aligning a bunch of work in 2022. Owlhead Mike Mountain Bike Trail. We had a really good day last Friday. One of my best days here. We, uh, we got up <laughs> side by side Friday morning. And uh, following up on the Section 57 that we submitted in May, we made contact with Nation Connect. And through that, there was a referral process. The Adams Band were interested in coming out. The Swatson were interested in coming out. So we jumped in a couple side by sides and we went up with, with Wes, who's a, a local uh, trail builder. And he has the area mapped out and we had a great morning up there. It was great. So uh, I got an email back immediately saying they had a really good time. And I had another email come in asking if they to give us a letter of support, which the province will need. Uh, and I got that letter today. So we've got a letter of support, so it's good. That's a little bit of our journey through there. Great views up there. Um, yeah, they were really open to some of the ideas and, and West has some really good plans. So we'll pick his brain and, and keep moving. Uh, that was the email I got. She had a really good time. Do you need a letter of support? So she's already delivered on that. So it's, it's good news. <laughs> So good news to uh, to the bridge. <laughs> had a bridge meeting on Tuesday, and uh, you know I see where they're at, and I'm I'm growing increasingly concerned about this bridge for the winter. I there's there's just no two ways about it. These are the pier caps that they are they're tying them with rebar. Today they started. Uh, that's been sitting there for a week. They've been trying to get a contractor in to do the rebar. They don't do it. And we really haven't had a lot of work done in a week. So at the meeting on Tuesday, I wanted to know what the plan was for the next four days. It'll be tying this and tying this other one. Uh, and then they're gonna pour it on Tuesday. And at that point, They've got to back up and excavate. Did I do that? They've got to excavate this whole abutment that's underground. It's already poured, which is good. But we've got to wait seven days once that's poured and peel back what's left of the deck and then put the girders on. And then we've got to prep the girders and get a membrane down. And then the asphalt has to come in. And they're saying they can do it. And I'm saying, show me. So <laughs> that's where we're at with that. Finlayson Waterfront. Uh, we haven't talked about this one in a long time. Uh, I touched base with, uh, with, with Landmark. They're helping us with this. Beginning in November, they'll be here for two weeks. The first two weeks of November, they're going to take out the wooden ramp and Mackey Square will be coming out. Uh, they're going to remove the ramp to the floating dock and then they will be installing a temporary dock and a ramp system to access the floating dock. They need divers in there to cut the piles and they'll be here the second week of November. So that's rolling along and this is, this is phase one that will get us rolling. Uh, paving. So I've been told by the end of October, we'll see the pavers back. Pine Street is still slated to be back. And then this is just 
something high level I thought I would uh, throw out there. Every year we've been, we've got a little reserve going for our lift station tops. And we were not sitting so, so well a few years ago. So really high level, this is the locations. We've got 15 locations and there's two, two columns here with the years in them. That's the age of the pumps, there's two pumps per lift station. So I've just color coded them. The red ones are over 20 years old. And we had quite a bit of red for three, four or five years ago. We're, we're catching up and now we're turning them green so that they're within 10 years. If we can get to a little tipping point in the next, we'll do one more year of this reserve and we'll have an average age of about eight years on our pumps. And we'll be able to take that reserve from 60,000 a year for pump replacement. We should be able to move it down to 23,000. So we're just trying to stay on top of that. That's, that's it for capital stuff. Comments or questions for Daryl at this stage? Bob and then, and then Jeff, go ahead. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Daryl. I, um, I agree, show me. Um, <laughs> with the bridge, are they still saying that they're hoping for the end of November? They are. Okay. Yeah. So weather dependent at this time of year. Dr. Malmus, go ahead. Thanks, Daryl. It's a lot of lot of items to deal with at the same time. Some of them will be coming to a, an end sometime, hopefully this year. Um, just in that picture you had of the bridge where you're showing the centerpiece, they're going to try and get the chicken wire on it to concrete. I, I noticed four shadows there, <laughs> that four Vic Van Isle shadows that were just looking at what they possibly could do or through the chair. Typically, there's two of them. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was in a conversation with Councillor Malmus earlier today, and he was uh, wanting to uh, jump that bridge uh, scan with his uh, motorcycle a little bit later on. Can we build a ramp there for him? Or Public Works would be happy to see that. <laughs> 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 Councillor Anderson and Councillor Bush will go ahead. Thanks, Daryl. Um, you've taken on a lot and you've done a great job. So hats off to you because you've picked up the ball and, and started running down the field with it. So back to my pet project, the uh, beach park. <laughs> so for sure, spring yeah. will be in full swing. Yeah, we'll have all the pieces. We'll have all the pieces in place early, early spring. We want to put it to bed this year intact in place we're going to have virtually everything done the pergola will be will be standing uh we'll have, we've got the playground ready to order and get it in here that'll go in and then we've just got a little bit of trail work around like the sod and all the the soft stuff's getting done and looked at now so yeah we'll be down running thank you Alter bush okay yeah, good work, Daryl. Uh, it uh, you you do have a lot on your plate, and you're doing a great job. So, uh, thanks. I appreciate what, for what you're doing. Really. That owl head uh, tour. Um, if you looked at that photo, it was amazing how much uh, fire resilience work they've been doing on the canopy below that. You can see it in that photo. It's amazing. Yeah. And uh, it's good you have support from Adams Lake Band, and uh, hopefully we'll get support from Splatchine. And yeah, no, keep up. On it. Thank you. Councillor McCabe, go ahead. Yeah, no, great job. Big workload there. Um, Saskia did that $75,000 grant for an art piece, and, and I think we picked the beach part for, for that. Any any update on that? Yeah, through the chair. Um, I did speak with the rep from Saskia yesterday, uh, and, and they've selected the the artist at this point, and uh, we're going we're gonna to facilitate uh, that process by having them out and we'll we'll talk in just I guess in concert on what makes sense for the location and then we'll help streamline the process through the archaeology and all that because Beach Park that's a bit of a nightmare. Thank you. All right uh, any other comments? Carol I tell you uh, you're doing an absolute amazing job um, at the same time um, those are some of the projects just for the benefit of the gallery. When we hit 2022, there's going to be infrastructure changes. Daryl's going to have even more on his plate. And um, 
And anyway, uh, kudos to Public Works and, and the way that the community looked this year as well during COVID and uh, we got flood mitigation issues and all that stuff coming down and and uh, the uh, the uh, building of the Bruin Bridge and uh, there's just a, there's a lot more. So anyway, good to you and your department. Thank you, Daryl. All right. Um, September bylaw enforcement summary. John, you're up. You got the floor. You give us the lowdown on who's doing what and uh, who's compliant. Um, well, this September has been a uh, very quiet month for a while. Um, very few complaints. As you can see by the report. Also, of course, with the tourist traffic uh, going home. Very low um, traffic violations uh, for the month of September. Um, so, really nice month. Uh, got caught up on a lot of paperwork, which was great. Uh, October, we started our uh, digital campaign on outdoor burning. And with the help of Sarah, uh, that's been posted on the website and on social media. Um, so I've got a few comments from the public on it, uh, all in the positive light, which is nice. Um, all right. Go ahead, Councillor McCabe. And thank you, through the chair. Um, it's not in the report or anything, but I was just curious about the uh, bears and sycamores, and you know, being our residents being bear aware and uh, not leaving out food sources. Uh, um, is that not an issue? Or are we doing okay there? Do you know? <clears throat> through the chair. Uh, I feel we're doing quite well in that. Uh, <laughs> Whenever there's been bear sightings that have been reported to us or uh, other predator sightings, uh, we've been uh, quick to mention them to Sarah, uh, get them out on the website or on the uh, social media. Um, and of course, with the uh, social media getting it shared within the public is, is very quick. Um, as for the food sources and such, with our unsightly bylaw or the good neighbor bylaw, now, I should say. Um, I've been out there and patrolling and looking for those food sources and uh, getting people to clean them up. Oh, excellent. Thank you very much. Thanks. Any other comments or questions for John? Go ahead, Councillor Bushel. To the chair. Yeah, John, later on tonight, we have a uh, uh, first reading on uh, dog bylaw. Or, um, just curiosity, I mean, this one's not a very good example, but during the summer when we have lots of, lots of uh, residents in town, um, what's the uh, complaints on dog violation, dog bylaw violation? Uh, through the chair, the majority of the complaints for dog violations is off leash. Um, most of the time when I'm out patrolling, if I see someone with a dog that's off leash, uh, I stop, I chat with them. They're really quick to comply to get their animals on the leash. Um, I don't think I've actually had a reoffender after I've talked to them. Thank you. All right, thanks. Uh, any, any other questions for John? Thanks, John. Keep up the good work. Thanks, John. Thanks, John. All right, uh, September building permit. Scott, uh, you got the floor. Give us a lowdown on that. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, it's September 21, 2021 building permits, uh, nine new permits down a little bit from 2020. Um, values down a little bit, probably one, one more single family dwelling makes a difference. Um, yeah, I'm just uh, just working through them. Looks like it slowed down a little bit from the summer, but uh, yeah, still still busy. Oh, good. Okay, comments or questions from Scott? You want to move into the de development applications? Sure. Uh, thank you, Chair. So yeah, these are our current development applications. Um, this could be updated a little bit. We have we got one new one last week, one new uh, development variance permit uh, last week, and then um, 21 to 11, uh, 530 Main. So the, the Planning and Development Committee did consider that one today as well, but uh, the rest of them, um, yeah, not much has changed, but uh, yeah, we'll update for you in two weeks anyway. Comments or questions? Just a comment in regards to the planning committee and uh, these discussions are happening uh, pre-development, thanks to Scott and uh, the planning department and uh, also the committee uh, that reviews this and more in, in order to move forward in a 
positive manner. So thanks to uh, Councillor Malmas who chairs that as well as the as the planning committee. And I think it's been very productive as uh, we move forward with um, some of these developments. All right, any other comments or questions? Hearing none, we'll move on. Okay, uh, the DOS strategy priorities. Uh, any comments from council in regards to the priorities that are listed up there on the screen? <laughs> Does anybody want to bring up any other priorities? I think some of them have already been brought up on what Daryl's just um, reported with. Um, comments? Okay, I'm hearing nothing from council, so we're going to move on. Okay, so Mayor and Councilor's reports. Uh, okay, Councilor Bushel, you can start out with your report. Mr. Chair, well, uh, like I say, I, I didn't get up to that owl head uh, uh, run that day. I had to work the full day, and uh, they were planning on being up there most of the day, so I didn't get up. But uh, Daryl took the crew and uh, Everett and Jeremy and uh, Wes from uh, the Snowmobile Club. Uh, Corbin Semp was going to go, but he couldn't make it as well. But uh, yeah, it was. Uh, they had a good day and had a good uh, peek at the uh, trails that have been marked and everything. So that uh, that went really well. I attended a Chamber of Commerce. Uh, requested a meeting here in the council chambers with Scott and uh, and Jennifer and uh, Colleen and myself. And they had a restaurant delegation that wanted to discuss just basically how tough they've been having a tough year with the restaurants. And uh, and we listened to them and uh, we talked about, uh, they were big concerned about the uh, uh, Mountain Park uh, uh, fast foods going in there. So we, you know, we had a good uh, conversation with them with that meeting. And then uh, planning planning committee meeting was uh, been uh, went really well today again. Uh, it's kind of nice to see some new some new activity. There's talk about a brewery and a few things like that. So yeah, um, pretty pretty productive last couple of weeks. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bushel, Councillor Anderson. Um, just to echo the chamber chat that we had last week um, that I attended with Gordon Scott um, as well. We met today with the uh, CHC. Um, architect and uh, the consultants. And that was a very, very informative um, meeting and uh, shed a lot of light on uh, what our community health care center could look like. Um, also meeting with the tourism advisory committee um, by the end of this week with Carly, we're gonna just catch up on some things. So that's it for me. Thanks, Councillor McCabe. Yeah, Matt. met, um... Of course, today with, with uh, our consultants, our, our architect and our um, community health center consultant and, and our builder, and that was a good meeting. And yesterday uh, we had a full day with the same team uh, with Evan and, and Councillor Aries and myself uh, in, in interview with Splatson. Had a very open discussion with your elders and, and community members about their vision of how the the shoe shop healing center will will look like and what services it could have um i think that's moving forward nicely i went for lunch at seniors today we haven't things have been moving so fast we really haven't had a chance to um get a <coughs> proper um, public communication out and uh, but staff's working on that so some seniors at lunch had some questions today that our, our consultant was nice enough to get up and, and, and help answer. And I tried my best to stand up and answer and, and so did Evan. So I, I think the, the people that were the seniors, the people that were at lunch today um, were happy with those answers and, and felt more comfortable once they had more information. Um, uh, staff asked me to attend, uh, council asked me to attend uh, uh, a, a Zoom webinar on uh, wooden bridge structures. And so I did, I thought it would uh, maybe help out with some ideas at a pedestrian bridge at the end of Main Street, but they're more of a smaller scale kind of bridge company with a smaller span. I don't think it could apply here. So I did attend that. It was just a marketing seminar more than anything, but I don't think it would be applicable to our community. That's about it for myself. Thank you, Councilor Aries. <clears throat> I attended a 
here here today prior to the meeting and also uh, yesterday with the uh, yeah the uh, the architect and uh, consultants that are going to be uh, building the new healing center and uh, there's not much to say about it because we're at the start of a start of a process and um, it's very exciting because we're working with uh, that's uh, got a lot of experience and and a lot of dedication and they're gonna help help us and our communities put together something that reflect the will of the communities, which is not really being designed in the, in the least right now. They're coming, uh, coming to our communities with open ears and they'll make ideas based on that. Uh, so it's um, this it very interesting and informative day to, uh, to say the least. Thank you, Councillor Malmas. Yeah, I too attended the uh, meeting this afternoon with the uh, I'm going to say the architect and the the, the builder um, and the, and some of the guiding force and um, you you have to hear what Avina has to say. Um, I, I I was a lot like a lot of people in town, a little skeptic about what might happen. Um, not to shoot Mr. Parliament in the foot, but he doesn't do justice to the description of what she describes as the vision. And um, it is a wellness center. It's going to benefit the community. There's going to be doctors there for everybody and other services. Um, they've built similar projects in multiple places uh, with a great amount of success. So. Um, it'd be very interesting to see what their conceptual design comes up with when they consider the inclusivity of everybody, um, First Nations and ourselves. Like this is a community wellness center. It's not an indigenous wellness center. It's not uh, a wellness center or a, a drop-in doctor's office like we currently have. It's, um, it, it's I think it's going to be good. I think that you have to allow the time for the designers and the architect to come back with their vision after they've heard what everybody has to say about the input. So I, I thought, like I said, very, very informative. Uh, she did a great job of explaining what they and how they put it together. And I hope that she passes that uh, on to our community because like she was at the senior center there was a lot of skepticism. There was people coming up and asking questions. And afterwards, I understand that some of the people that were skeptic were actually giving her a hug and thanking her. So she must be on the right track. And it's not her first rodeo either. So she's done this a multiple number of times. So I also chaired the planning committee meeting today. Um, and, uh, most new projects come to us discuss it and help give them some direction and where they might go. Um, we did talk about uh, a couple different projects in town um, and some concerns that the planning committee had. Um, the planning committee is a public meeting, so we discussed a uh, uh, Quonson style building on a piece of property in the community and people complaining about it and that uh, it's a permitted use. So staff did what they were supposed to do. They permitted it. The neighbors are complaining, um, but in our OCP or in our zoning bylaws, it doesn't cover off uh, a form and character for a building. So I have an acreage with a 25 acres and I have that same quantum on my property uh, that somebody built in a residential area. So. There's just checks and balances to everything. And so the zoning bylaws are not adopted yet and there's chances for everybody. And I hope that everybody does have a look at it. And if you see something in there that you have a question about, you should come to the planning development committee because it's being reviewed at that, or you should send a note into our staff because they're still accepting, they got some provisions to do. And, and this is an important document for our community. It needs to be done right because I'm going to say it's uh, 93, so, you know, it's uh, 30 years old. 
and we're updating it. And it may be 30 years before it gets reviewed again. I don't know, uh, but it's critical to the growth of our community. So it would be super fine if everybody could make a comment or at least have a look at it. And if there's something that concerns you, make a comment about it now. Don't wait till after it becomes adopted and then start saying, well, it doesn't work because that'll be too late. I also was uh, at the rail trail meeting on Friday, um, District of Sycamus through the EOF fund, which is a 50-50 split between us and Malacqua area E, Rhode Martin, we contributed $232,000 to the rail trail, which they got a grant for 500,000, which is going to allow them to actually, and it's mandatory with the money, they have to open the piece of the trail that they applied for the money for. It's not going to be, let's say up to uh, standard. It's They're gonna level it, smooth it, and it's still gonna have uh, railway ballast on it, but they'll pack it so that it's walkable or a large tire bike would be able to travel down it. So it's it's slated for next year. So um, hopefully they get that portion done and it's open for use and it's going to, it's 19.2 kilometers. So it's from kilometer zero, which is right underneath the highway bridge to the old town site of Mara. And so if they have sufficient funds to go further, uh, then they'll go a little further as far as they can with the, with the 732,000. That's my report. Okay, thanks, Jeff. Councilor Evans. Thanks. Um, I'm kind of the liaison for council to the schools. With my role, I went to the PAC meeting at the high school and uh, tried to encourage the, uh, the principal there and uh, his very tired staff and it's only beginning of October. Um, COVID has been a marathon for, for teachers and students and the second half of the marathon is the hardest part. So uh, if you know any teachers or uh, families with kids in high school, encourage them, um, you know, with the mask mandate for the little ones starting last week, it was a lot, it was hard on a lot of little kids at Parkview and the, the I was talking to the principal of Parkview School and the staff there, and they're very tired because uh, kids get really emotional when they get uncomfortable. It's been hard. Um, so it's, it, is, it is a marathon, and I think that we really have to try our best to encourage people instead of um, focusing on the negative. And, um, and that's something that I think we really have to work on. And uh, sometimes it's just a good cup of coffee and drop off some fresh baked cookies. You wouldn't believe what I could do for somebody. Um, and uh, I also went over to our daycare trying to help them get some social media advertising, um, the beautiful facility. And we just need people to know that they, daycare is there. And there's a lot of new people in town, so we want them to know about that. So I was working on that. We had that extra meeting last week to talk about the exciting things. I've been here 13 years, the end of September, and what's going on in Sycamus is fantastic with Habitat for Humanity wanting to come in and help us out with a housing shortage and uh, what a gift to Sycamus and um, and also uh, you know the exciting healing center coming down and uh, the design and the needs of the community that will meet so I'm pretty excited what was going on in Sycamus. Well so my report okay so uh, I uh, attended um, a um, an event at uh, Quayot Lodge. Uh, it's uh, I, I uh, sit on the board with the Economic Trust of the Southern B uh, Southern BC. It used to be Southern Interior Development Initiative Trust. Changed its name. Anyway, I was at Quayot Lodge, and uh, it was on September thirtieth uh, during the Truth and Reconciliation, and. Um, one of the things that I really noticed when I was at Quayot Lodge was the concept and the building of the lodge and uh, and the native artwork uh, when it comes to the carvings and the doors and the ceiling and whatnot. And during that conversation, I talked to one of the individuals there in regards to um, Douglas Cardinal. Douglas Cardinal is uh, is um, 
uh, working for um, uh, the district of Sycamus now as an architect when it comes to building this new building designed um, that we have given the green light uh, at the end of Main Street, uh, which we have over $6 million worth of grant funding in order to build this particular building in order to house medical professionals at the end of the day. But the um, feedback that I got from um, these individuals that I talked to about this architect who happened to be today at the seniors center having dinner and then did a presentation here with uh, their group. Uh, his work is absolutely amazing. And uh, some of the buildings that he's built and he's built them all across Canada and actually all over North America. And, um, and we are so fortunate to be able to have this person and uh, and uh, the uh, team that he has working with him in order to, to develop something that's going to be absolutely amazing. Now, one of the problems that we've had with the community up to this particular point in time, and we discussed this at the Eagle Valley Housing uh, meeting today at dinner, and that we haven't really been communicating well with the with uh, the public, we've made decisions as to how we're going to allocate all this pro allocate all of this property when it comes to 200 Main and the property that we bought on Main Street in order to build this uh, this commercial and housing development. And uh, and now we're putting together with staff a communications plan to make sure that as we move forward through the process, that everybody's well informed and uh, we're talking about hopefully having a town hall meeting and getting everybody that has uh, got questions about what we're trying to accomplish uh, will have their opportunity to, uh, to ask questions and maybe say their part. So that's in place. Um, a lot of other things going on today. And one thing that I really noticed today was uh, in the Shushwap tourism presentation, uh, the pictures on hole number four on Hyde Mountain and how it overlooks the uh, overlooks the lake and uh, and uh, we weren't happy with Shuswap tourism and uh, sometime back council made a decision that we were going to opt out of it and I tell you what it did it really got their uh, interest really quick as to the importance that Sycamore Springs to the table when it comes to being part of this uh, tourism program. And so today they had a really good presentation. Carly, our economic development coordinator is working directly with them. And I think they're gonna be a major asset for us now in the future. And so I hope that the deliverables are gonna be there. I know that now Sam and Arm is also looking at the deliverables when it comes to shoe shop tourism. And I think that we're finally gonna get the results uh, that we require based on what we're paying into this particular program. So there's something that is happening here that could be very beneficial. This week, uh, Jeff and I will be going to Cas Caslo. Uh, we're gonna be talking to the mayor there and um, they are putting together fiber optics in that entire community and down the, down the line with some of the other Boswell and some of the other communities as well. There's a combination of this particular project that's really of interest. So if we get fiber optics to each individual house in the, in the community, which we're hoping to, because now there's a, a, over a billion dollars that's been allotted by the federal government in order to get high-speed internet into all of our homes. If we have the opportunity to build this, we will be able to build a three-foot ditch and, and, and we'll be able to put a natural gas pipeline at the bottom of it and then fiber optics on the top of it and we can probably get this infrastructure paid for by the federal government through grant funding and it will accomplish two things high-speed internet and also natural gas to all the homes in Sycamus. and uh, but we've got some we've got some challenges in front of us and but we're hoping to get this accomplished so we're working on that uh, I really am uh, I'm uh, looking forward to seeing section 57 uh, build out. I think that we have some concerns uh, 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 with section 57, that's the owl head bike park. And you can take a negative and turn it into a positive. We had the wildfires that looked at burning up on that hillside and whatnot. And one of the best places to build a bike park 
is through a burn. And that's uh, what we're going to be looking at. And I think we're going to have, and talking with the ministry um, during um, the Ministry of Lands and Forest during the um, during the um, um, uh, UBCM, the Union of Municipal uh, Municipalities, uh, they put us on top of their pile when it comes to priorities, when it comes to Section 57. And I can't imagine what it'll do when it comes to the collaboration between the uh, the rail trail corridor and we get a bike park on the, on top of, of, of Owlhead and whatnot. It's going to be so beneficial to us and especially now with the build out of uh, Habitat for Humanity, we're finally going to maybe find a formula for getting housing in Sycamuse because I attended an event um, at Sycamus Houseboats and six young men come up to me and said, Mr. Mayor, can we talk to you? And I said, yeah, for sure. And uh, we talked about housing. I says, where do you live? And he said, well, I live at Swansea, I live in Vernon, I live at Greenwood, I live in Salmon. I'm not one of them lived in Sycamus. I says, what if, what if we had some rental housing for you to live in Sycamus? Would you live here? Absolutely, we wanna live here. So this is not just about housing, this is about building up a workforce and, and encouraging young people to come to our community. Council's starting to look at me because I'm getting long-winded, so I'm gonna end this shortly here. So I just wanna thank ASCUs. $100,000 they're donating to the rail corridor. And I know we're putting in $500,000 and 232,000 to the economic development in order to get our portion of the rail trail built out. And we wanna see this happening sooner than later, because I can't imagine what it's gonna do for the economics of this community once we get that done. But it's really interesting when a, when a, when a corporate uh, grocery store chain comes up with $100,000 to help support this and the importance you know, to the rail corridor and the support that they're giving our community and uh, the communities along the corridor. And so I wanna thank them for, for the, the, their donation and, and, and also uh, the, um, the um, fundraising committee and all the hard work they're doing over and above the grant funding that we need. And uh, I just hope that one thing does happen when we develop the rail corridor and that, that local help and local contractors are recognized when it comes to uh, helping build this uh, trail out. And uh, I uh, have to thank uh, Councillor Malmus, who now sits on the Rail Trail Governance Committee, making that point the other day that uh, that really resonated with, uh, with the committee in order to get local contractors working on that, because that's important. I think it's important for two reasons. I think we'll probably get them to build up the rail corridor, but at the same time, we'll probably get a lot of uh, benefits from it by giving them the opportunity. And at the same time, I'm sure that they'll do it for a real reasonable price. And the last thing is this um, uh, medical center, health, wellness, whatever, and the decisions that council finally made, and they made these decisions in the best interest of this community. And I really feel that's the case. I know that there's gonna be some resistance because there's gonna be people that feel that 200 Main should continue to be a park. But once you see the architect build or, or lay out this, it will be a green space. They're planning on keeping the trees in there. They're trying to build the, the building around it. I just hope that people are patient with us and wait until we can actually lay out the concept and then form your own opinion from there. But this council feels it's the best thing uh, in the best interest of the community. All right, that's enough for me. I've got way more, but uh, I think that's a, that's a lot for now. Okay, so we're gonna move on. Uh, rise and report, recommendation of the community, the whole now rise and report. Uh, at, um, what is it, 6.30, right? Wow, okay. I uh, need a mover on that. Councillor McCabe, Councillor Bushel, all in favor? Carry, thank you. 
Now we're going to go into a public input period. Now we have people possibly online that might have their hands up or the gallery you. I will give you now, uh, you have five minutes uh, in which to state anything that you'd like to talk about and uh, state your name and um, let us uh, give us your take. Thank you, Mr. Mayor Council. My name is Steve Selinger. I've been a part-time resident of this community for roughly 25 years. Now I'm about to say that I'm a full-time the group. I came here originally in 1972, and I love it here. Simple. I am a multi-property owner, multi-property taxpayer. I am not against one of the larger topics tonight, which is the development of a uh, lot. 200 on Main Street, actually support that type of thing. But as we all know, location, 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 it's a very important part of any development in any community. I see a green area downtown that I believe was purchased as to remain as green by the district some time ago. I've been told in the last few years that the 400 blocks here on Main Street, we're going to be the prime location for the wellness, medical, uh, healing. I, I'm so confused right at this point. You know, I'm glad to hear that you guys are going to put it out to the public stronger for opinion and, and awareness. I think it's pretty big because the last week has been all of them now. Uh, I don't understand at this point in time what the building is going to be. Design is way down the road. We all know that. But I'd like to comment that I am a Two property owner directly to the north of that 200 block. And it does, I do have concerns uh, when I see a first condition and it's a big square blue three story building with all the trees gone. I'm going to speak up. That's why I'm here. I'd like to say that uh, perhaps one of your choices is very good. Mr. Cardinal is very renowned. Uh, my background was in the construction industry for 45 years. I worked extensively with Scott Building in Alberta, many projects, many. And I think you'll have a good team. But I'm going to ask council to please perhaps reevaluate location and to put it to the public in a different way. I, I read in some of the, uh, the blurbs online, whatever, that it was the preferred choice. I'm curious as to what the other choices were. For location of this type of facility. I, I believe you need it, don't get me wrong. It's, I'm not against it at all in any way, shape, or form, but I am concerned about location. Thank you for your time. Okay. Yeah, thank you for that. And uh, and we recognize that and we made the decision. And, and so uh, we'll be informing, you know, the community as we move into the next step so that you have a total understanding of what we're trying to accomplish. So, yeah, so very good points and uh, we're cognizant of them as well. Thank you. Councillor Malmas, go ahead. Um, I'd just like to state for the record that just because it looked like a park, and we've had public functions there. The property is still designated as downtown commercial. It was never a park. We didn't purchase it as a park. We never changed it to a park for the specific reason. We weren't a hundred percent sure what it might become. It was, so it never got a park designation. It's the same as the main street landing. That's still a road. It's not a park, but because it looks like a park and it, quacks like a park, people think it's a park. <laughs> and that's why the Main Street Bridge is not there. So um, the, the District of Sycamore has made some extent. There's five councils before us that didn't change the designation of that road access to a bridge. They all had the opportunity to do it. And for five councils before us, they all saw the same document that MOTI came with put a bridge on Main Street to alleviate that turnoff at Spall Machine, or is that Spall Machine Road? Mm. And so, um, but we did not vote that to be parkland ever, so. All right, thanks. Uh, uh, well, uh, I have, I've got one person with their hand up um, online. Um, uh, so, Jen, could you invite them on, please? Christiane, uh, you should be already unmuted yourself, you're ready. Hi, sure, thanks. Yeah, my name is Christiane. I'm a new resident of Sycamus. Um, and I do have a few comments and a few questions regarding the development of 200 Main Street. 
Um, we understand that this project has been in the works for quite some time. Uh, and although we welcome uh, a healing and treatment center within the community, we believe that we as stakeholders deserve a chance to speak on the issue and be a part of the decision-making process in developing this green space. And I understand it, it is zoned commercial, but I hope that you guys also understand that it's one of the last remaining green spaces in the town center. Um, I'm wondering, I have a few questions here. I'm wondering what impact will the loss of the central green space have on the community? Um, has a community impact study been done? Um, and if so, where is the information compiled and may we have access to it? Um, it's, I think we feel deeply concerned that the decision seems to have been made without public consultation. Um, will there be any type of a town hall? Um, will we have a chance to speak um, on the matter? Will our opinions be heard? You know, where exactly is council at on in the process is what I'm wondering. Um, is there a chance for us to, to have an opinion? Does our opinion count? It feels like the decision was sort of just made without, without any uh, public consultation. And I think that's where most of us are feeling, uh, you know, like, yeah, I think we're just feeling a little bit put aside, right? Um, so is the council, here's my question, is the council willing to put the development plans on hold in order to gain a better understanding on how this new center and sub subsequent loss of our green space will affect the community? Um, are you willing to talk to us basically is what I'm asking. All right, thank you for that. Um, yeah, so uh, we will be uh, laying out uh, the uh, plans and the and the direction uh, and public consultation will be taking place for sure in the future. All right, now we have another hand up. Uh, who is that? Uh, that looks like Sherry. Oh, yeah. Am I here? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, I have several uh, concerns about this. First of all, the community, I think is it's well known that a, a wellness center or a health center was being planned, but it seems like the, uh, um, the council has decided without any community consultation to go ahead with this specific plan without notifying the district of any of the details. Um, and I have great concerns with that being right downtown. And uh, I don't live downtown, but it is my community. And I know, um, and, and that's part of the problem because it hasn't been put forward exactly what is planned to go in there. Is it gonna be doctors, dentists, um, addiction treatment, alcohol treatment? Is there going to be, uh, it's been mentioned about, um, Sorry, bad brain here. Um, rentals going in there? Is it going, you know, I don't want uh, downtown Sycamus to end up like downtown Vernon, downtown Kelowna. Um, call me a NIMBY. I know these facilities and resources are needed, but I don't think that's the place if that's going in. And council has been very remiss about making any information available to the public. I mean, a community health center and provision of local and wellness services. What does that mean? That could be mean anything. And I'm, I'm really concerned and I'm concerned that it's a done deal. It's going ahead regardless what the community thinks. All right, thank you. Uh, we have one more uh, person up there with their hand. Uh, we're running out of time, so uh, is it Trevor? There is one um, actually from Eileen first, and I'll just read it out because she's Okay, yeah, go ahead, Jen, bring um, them on. So actually, me, Jen, I, I am on the line. I can, oh, I can ask Perfect. it. Hey, guys, uh, Eileen Doonan here. I'm, um, you know, I think people that have spoke before me, I, I, would, uh, I would echo their sentiments. Um, I've been a property owner in Sycamus for about 12 years, and 
and coming to the region for a lot longer than that. Uh, Terry, um, I worked with you during the fires and the evacuation. I'm the Strata President for Legacy on Mara. Um, we love the community as everybody on the call and in council does. What, what is actually bothersome for me is that the questions that are being answered tonight aren't, or sorry, the questions that are being asked tonight are actually not being answered tonight. Um, and so I'm not sure I'm familiar enough with this forum, but I would assume that when, when somebody asks, has there been an impact study done, that somebody on council would respond to that today, tonight, right now. So um, I think you, have to, you guys all have to understand that everybody that's speaking here and participating are doing it because everyone feels invested. And I think it's a, uh, it's a missed opportunity for council to actually pause and think about how they can get the community more engaged. We have a lot of facilities in our town that have started well and ended poorly. I think you just need to drive around Sycamus to, to get a sense of that. Um, so, you know, I do want to pause and ask you guys, can somebody answer some of these questions tonight instead of just acknowledging the question without an answer? Thank you. Go ahead, Evan. Okay, thank you. Um, I will try my best. Um, to the first question, um, there will be a town hall meeting. Um, I heard that loud and clear today at the seniors drop-in center. Um, the district of Sycamus accepts responsibility when you look at the strategic priorities that we issued and the definition of some of these projects. I read it myself and I look back and I try to take my municipal hat off and I just look at it. Development of a shoe shop healing center, recruitment of medical professionals, creation of seniors daycare, respite services, community health center, provisions, local health services, community wellness strategy and wellness center. I'm now confused. Um, what is a community health center? What, what is a healing center? Are they two separate facilities? Is it one facility? Where is it going? Um, why is it 200 main? And so today um, we heard from a lot of people asking the same questions I've heard tonight. And so all of a sudden it's like, okay, we need to stop. We know why these decisions were made because we're trying to keep two projects going, a housing development that's gonna deal with attainable and affordable housing and meet that need. And also building this community health center, which is the same term as the healing center, which is the same term as the wellness center. It's all one, it's just one facility. It's, it's, it's a clinic that's gonna be available to everyone. And so the people are saying, uh, we've got questions. And one of the questions was, uh, 200 Main being a park, not a park. Um, what's the work you're doing on Beach Park? What are the improvements you're doing on Beach Park? Um, where are the events going to be held if we build on 200 Main? And we've had tremendous success hold, holding events on 200 Main. So yes, um, I, I've heard it loud and clear, and I would recommend that Council um, have a town hall meeting where we can unveil some of the concepts we've been looking at, and it's all conceptual right now and answer some of these questions, but specifically to your question, to the lady who asked, has there been a um, impact assessment done on any parks and lack of parks or additional uh, park space? The answer is no, there's been a trail and, and a recreation a master plan being talked about as we work toward opening up our rail to trail in conjunction with CSRD. We have our own municipal trail and linear parks in Sycamus. Um, but what we have done is improved our current park space, specifically the beach park area, which we need to unveil to the public. What do the beach park improvements mean? How, how are those, gonna, uh, those lands going to hold festivals and events if we lose space on Main Street? And we want to make sure it's clearly understood that 200 Main is going to also have public space and park space designed with this this incredible potentially award-winning facility that has low impact, keeps the trees, et cetera. So, you know, the short, the short answer is we got to have a town hall, field these questions from the public, explain why we're using all these separate terms. And that's what's confusing a lot of people. 
We, the district, have been throwing out the wellness center. Okay, what is that? The, the medical center, what is that? The healing center, what is that? Um, Habitat for Humanity, where did they come from? I, I hadn't heard that. I'd heard about Eagle Valley Housing, but what about this? What, what's Habitat for Humanity? So, um, again, um, yes, I, I've heard it loud and clear. We got to have a town hall. Okay, we got to get people in the room and feel these questions. I love the passion and the involvement. Um, we, we think this is going to be very exciting, but all of us on council and staff know that 200 Main, when it's used, and we have that tremendous event on July, you know, and we had the, the events in mid-July when the stomp was here, it was well attended. And that's why we've directed a lot of funds up to a million dollars to improve Beach Park, to provide brand new washroom facilities with a concession, with an amphitheater, the sod was laid today. I encourage everyone to go have a look. I know the weather's sort of miserable, but I think you'll be impressed what we're doing in Beach Park. Um, so I want to answer a lot of questions tonight, but I certainly can do that. In terms, and I'll, I'll just end on this note, and I've heard the same thing. Addiction center, a detox center, an addict, a, 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 a substance abuse center. That's not what we're building. Um, those facilities in the province of BEC are operated by the private sector primarily because of access. Um, you can get into a private facility a lot quicker than you can get assistance through Interior Health. Now, Interior Health offers um, support services for addictions. They offer uh, advice on substance abuse, but it's an outpatient service, okay? You don't stay there for a week, two weeks. You're basically charged as an outpatient. You come in, there's some referrals, there's some education. And then if you refer to a private facility, which is residential, it's overnight, there's kitchen facilities, there's, there's, there's uh, three meals a day, there's counseling, there's therapy, um, that's handled by the private sector. Uh, there's two in Salmon Arm, there's one in Vernon, just outside of Vernon, there's several in Kelowna. That's not what we're building here. In short, what we're building here is our new medical facility that's open to splat chain and area and ourselves, indigenous, non-indigenous. We call it healing because it's both physical and mental health. And it, it's gonna provide a wide range of services to all residents, regardless of lineage and, and, and race, and et cetera. But it is not an addiction center. It is not a detox center um, because we can't afford to build that. The private sector already offers that. It'll be a referral center if we have to send a patient for treatment, we will refer them to the private sector or through IHA's outpatient program. Um, we're not competing with that. So using all these different names, you know, I certainly apologize on behalf of council because I do read it now. I'm looking at it right now and I'm saying, yeah, it's confusing. Where's all this going? So yes to a town hall. Thank you. Thanks, Evan. Um, I, I I think that's great. Sorry, this is Eileen again, and I appreciate the feedback. Um, I guess that that addresses one small piece of it, but I think the larger piece also, you guys as council have to recognize that your constituents are feeling a little shut out. So it's one thing to say, yes, we'll have a town hall, but what is gonna be the output of that town hall? Um, the first lady, and forgive me, I, I didn't catch her name. She asked a very direct question. I think it was a very, um, respectful but intentional question, which was, is council willing to put this on pause until they seek the right input from the right stakeholders? Because I would offer you that perhaps your stakeholder management has been poor and there's a lot of gaps in it. And we don't want a, a project that starts with good intention, but ultimately fails because we didn't engage the right stakeholder group. Sycamus is a small enough community that you can engage the town proper um, and and still go ahead and do the right thing. So I would put that question back to you is you've heard enough of feedback to say, hey, we're not in the loop. We don't have all of the answers. And until such time as we do, like for instance, if you if you say, no, we have not done an impact assessment, then wouldn't it be an opportunity to actually pause and, and get that done? Because there those are things that should really feed good design. Um, it should feed good um, lessons learned. And we wanna make sure that whatever is built there 
um, benefits and, and has um, every opportunity for long-term success. So I would put that back to you guys. Are you willing to put this on pause to allow the right stakeholder engagement and see what comes of that? All right, thanks Eileen for that. And uh, yeah, so uh, we'll coordinate this. Uh, Evan, one last comment. It's an easy to move on. It's an easy answer. The answer is yes, because we haven't started. All we've done is announced that we're gonna put Habitat for Humanity affordable housing on Main Street. We're looking at 200 Main for this healing center. We have to engage with our consultants and the public and has started. We just announced that this is the preferred location. A question was, were there other locations? Yes, there were. We're trying to save both projects with the limited land we have. We first started this affordable housing project on Finlayson. That was our first preferred location that collapsed. We moved it in conjunction with Eagle Valley on Main Street and then Habitat for Humanity came on board and we're trying to save that project and find them land. So to put the project on pause is easy because we haven't really started. If anything, the public has said, let's not do anything till we have this town hall and I'm fully committed to that. And it's not like I have to call the consultants and stop because we haven't issued a permit. We haven't even come to a design on the building yet. So this is good timing for the public to say, hold it council. We need to have more discussion on this. And so all I can promise is we will do that. And yes, we can put it on pause because we haven't started and let's have the town hall meeting and let's further discuss this. So I, I appreciate that. Thank you. All right, thanks. Uh, all right, so. Council uh, McCabe, you want to? Yeah, uh, I feel I should respond a little bit. Um, the public has a right to know what we're doing. We're acting in what we feel is the best interest of the public. I'm just looking at some of the questions. Uh, uh, what impact on the community? Uh, we, we didn't do an impact study when we bought the property because it's zoned downtown commercial, still zoned downtown commercial. Um, it's, it's, it was bought by public funds and, and uh, while we owned it, uh, it's been used by the public. COVID came, but before COVID came, we bought a portable stage, we bought portable washrooms and uh, it got a lot of use. Uh, we put a lot of money into the beach park this year, close to a million dollars, the new washrooms and upgrade facilities there, playgrounds. And uh, we still have the dog park and it's got a lot of acreage there for public use, not just as a dog park. Um, where are we in the process? We've, we've hired, we went out for an expression of, in, of interest. And we've hired a consultant team. And part of that team is, uh, is uh, Dr. Evine Defoyo, who is um, well-respected in the United States, has built a lot of community health centers, owns a few of her own. Um, she's a doctor. Uh, it's her job and a team to make sure that once this facility is built, it, it, it serves the needs of the, of, the, of the community and outlying area, and that it's sustainable as far as uh, uh, monetary, you know, operationally, it's sustainable. Uh, also on a team, we have a world now, a world renowned architect, uh, Douglas Cardinal. Um, Douglas doesn't need to do this. He's recognized globally uh, for his projects in, in the States and, and across Canada. He's built quite a few community health centers. One of the intentions of uh, Council is to move the existing facilities from our current Sikimus um, Health Clinic, if, if, if that's what we're calling it, on Finlayson there, and, and move all those um, professionals into our new building. So that this new building, uh, the Shoe Shop Healing Center, will house uh, our community health center as, as part of the function of that facility. And when you have a community health center, it's it's advantageous to have it at a, a convenient downtown location that's easily accessible, especially for uh, um, seniors and people with disabilities. Uh, the district of Sycamus has, has limited funding. You can't just go out and buy property. We've, we've owned that property. I think we bought it maybe in our first term when I was in my first term as, as a counselor. Uh, we might, it might be five or six years in. 
And uh, when we did the grant application for the Shoe Shop Healing Center, we called it the Shoe Shop Healing Center for a reason, because we partnered with Splatson in the, in the grant application. And we received $5.95 million, call it $6 million for sake argument. And, but when we did that grant application, we had to name a piece of property that we own that we're willing to put forward uh, for the project. At that time, we didn't own 417 or 425 or the back half of 433 on Main. Uh, the only property uh, that was large enough and had a footprint and suitable enough to house both uh, the healing center portion and our new community health center was 200 Main. So when we put the application in for the grant application over three, four years ago, I believe, and that's a public document, um, we named 200 Main as the location for the Shoe Shop Healing Center. And it's called Shoe Shop Healing Center because it's a regional facility. It's meant for not just our community, but to service the region like Malakwas, Swansea Point, Enderby, um, as, as possibly as far as Chase. We're creating a new model that doesn't exist anywhere. And I think that's the reason Douglas Cardinal chose to put his name on this project and, and, and came and spent, lives in Ottawa, came and spent last two days here. And the same thing as um, Dr. Dean Tofoyo. Um, I don't think either of those two folks need the kind of money that we're offering them to do this. They want to put their name behind it because we're doing something that needs to be done. We're doing something that's, that's right. I, I, I want to just uh, read one email here. I lost it. I had it here. Just bear with me. This is an email from a person that's uh, uh, not with us anymore, but it, it, it hit my heart pretty good. It's in comments to about Trudeau and his uh, the, the hiring the church to do residential schools. And the reason we have this funding is through the truth and reconciliation and calls for action. So this project is following uh, the United Nations recommendations of 98 uh, calls to action, and I, I believe, don't quote me, but it's action 22 and 24, truth and reconciliation, specifically healing. We partnered with Splatson when we did this application. I just want to read uh, something that was posted on June 6th of this year in response to Trudeau and about uh, the church and the residential schools. Know what I think is unfair? Kidnapping, rape, torture, murder. Unmarked graves, cover ups, lies. I could, I could go on, but I think you'll get it. So, what we're trying to do here is um, offer out a hand to our neighbors to take action in truth and reconciliation and, and not just talk. And I think the model that we're going to create, and both Douglas Cardinal, I said today, that's why he put his name behind it. And Dr. Abin Tafoyo is that we're, we're probably three or four years ahead of most of the community in British Columbia. And, and this could be a model for other small communities to follow. And, and Steve, I, I, with all due respect, I'm sorry for your loss recently, and, but that was posted from your sister. I feel strongly about this and I think we're doing the right thing. Um, so other questions, concerns about right downtown. It needs to be accessible, it needs to be downtown. We don't have money to put it anywhere else. We're trying to juggle three projects at the same time that are all dear to the community. And we're working with the Eagle Valley Senior Citizens Housing Society to bring in 36 units of affordable housing, 20 for seniors and 16 for young families. Young families are going on the backside of 417 and 425 with shared parking on, on the backside of 433. And the front was going to be, uh, we were going to move the healing center from 200 Main to 417. And then Habitat for Humanity came and a project in Enerby that uh, they've been working on for a year and a half to the stage that they put about $150,000 into it. And they had drawings ready to go to tender and then council 
in energy for whatever reason they have, I'm sure there were good ones, canceled the project on the 11th hour. And so Habitat came to our committee and said, do you guys want this? Yeah, we're not going to say no. We need housing desperately. And uh, it's roughly a $15 million project. And according to Bill, the executive director for Habitat Humanity, that brings a spinoff of uh, four to one. So that brings a spinoff of $60 million to our community. Um, um, how can a person say no to that? We don't have money to buy more land. So we, we tried to figure out what we could do and the best way we could do it with the land we have. And, and when Douglas looked at the property in 200 Main, he, he said, that's perfect because it's, it's close to the water. It's, it's sort of away from you know, the, the main part of Main Street and Habitat for Humanity with, with the Eagle Valley Senior Citizens Housing Society and the 16 units for young family going on the backside of the property and then the 20 units for the seniors on, on the housing society's property and uh, the 58 units that the Habitat for Humanity is trying to bring to our community on the front side of the property. We had limited choices. Um, the federal government's already approved 200 main for the healing center. Um, here at 200 main used to be a BCNU, uh, a bunch of little cabins. The old version of Sycamus's affordable housing. Um, it's never been designated a park. We bought it for future use because we've seen the um, <laughs> um, opportunity there. It was never designated for a park, just like Councillor Mama said. Our road allowance at uh, Main Street Landing was never designated as a park because we're hoping for a car bridge across that. We got pushed back from uh, special interest groups that weren't interested in what was best for the community. And the Ministry of Transportation chose not to put a car bridge there. We're still pushing hard with cooperation from um, Splatson to try to put a pedestrian bridge at the end of Main Street because it is still a road allowance. 200 Main is 1.54 acres in downtown of commercial zone property that impact study yeah we're going to have a new community health center and 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 a healing center and it's going to be a model for the rest of uh you see i think western canada probably canada uh what are the benefits mental health physical health spiritual health um immeasurable um let's see the strength present questions and answers uh the project is fully funded. We have the property, we have the consultants, we have the builder, we have the architect, we have Dr. Avine who makes sure that it's sustainable and, and designed properly. She's well known for sustainability in her community health centers. Um, that's where we are in the process. We've hired an architect, we've showed him 200 main. We told them that's where we think uh, the healing center should go. If the town says no, I, I don't see an option. And we have to say no to uh, 58 units of affordable housing to move the healing center there or, or, or cancel the healing center, tell the federal and provincial government that we don't care. We don't want to build it because the community says no. I, I don't see very many options. We, we did recently receive $50,000 to do a master plan for our, uh, our uh, trails, our, our trail system, uh, but that won't, uh, we don't have a master plan for parks. Um, we, we do have some green space that we have put money into it and we'll open up our new facilities at the beach park this, this spring. And um, we also still have the dog park. Um, so thank you for that, Councillor McCabe. I think that uh, everything that Councillor McCabe has just uh, mentioned in, a, in, his, uh, his, in his report as to answering some of the questions is something that needs to be brought to a town hall meeting and so that the complete community understands what we're trying to do and you laid it out very well, Councillor McCabe. We have, I'm going to, I'm going to allow two more speakers and we have to uh, see you over there, Mary, just hang on. I have one more person online, a fellow by the name of uh, Trevor. Yeah. Trevor, uh, I'm going to give you the opportunity to speak. Uh, so uh, 
you're online. Uh, so give us your take. Thank you. Trying to get you up here. Are you online? Maybe we can come back to Trevor if uh, Mary wishes to speak. All right, Mary, go ahead. Okay, um, I'm really, really in favor of green space. You can call it parks, whatever, but green space. Um, I don't know what your plans are for the doctor's office. I mean, that's another option. And at the end of Main Street here, in the, in the plans that I've seen, there's 67 parking stalls, 67. And then you're saying that it's gonna be okay for... Yeah, so Mary, I, something that happened today, that, that concern came up and uh, we mentioned it, actually Councilor Malmus mentioned it to the architect as how that we can build out the parking uh, uh, as a component to the actual design and uh, and how we could turn that so that it, it could actually be almost utilized as green space. So the, the problem that we have right at this particular stage, and I think this is where the community is concerned, is there's a design coming forward from an architect that is world renowned and you should see some of his works. It's absolutely amazing. And we're gonna have him working for us and, and until you actually see the design and how this is all gonna be laid out, I think you might change your opinion of it well, later on. Yes. Now, but all the design was for where they ripped down the houses. Yeah. And then it's gonna leave the doctor's office open, with nothing in it. And now all of a sudden, you see on Facebook this other development, like, whoa, what are you supposed to think? I think Councillor McCabe laid it out quite well. Councillor Malmas, you wanted to comment? Yes, if I could. Um, I don't, I'm sorry, I don't, didn't catch your name. The first, Mary, can I? Hang on a second, Mary, we're going to answer your question. Ask your name, please, sir. Steve. Yeah, you. No. Steve. 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 Um, if, if you if you have been in the construction business and you talked about uh, Cardinal the architect mm -hmm. and you looked at some of his stuff and then you said you've worked with Scott Builders and I'm not exactly sure how that blue drawing got out there because that was just a drawing to see what the square footage was accommodate for parking if you saw it it had a little park at the one end of it they were continuing to keep some of the park there. Uh, but that was, I didn't know that that was public information. So uh, just let me finish, please. So we had that conversation today with the architect and, yeah. and went through this stuff. And one of the things that, boy, I can't ever get her name, Avine, Avina? Avine Tupoya. Avine. Avine. So what she said was, is that, you know, they, they built the facility and what they do is they use the way uh, Cardinal designs his buildings, they put corners and he doesn't build a square rectangular building ever. So that blue box would have been a total misrepresentation of anything that he's ever built. And therefore um, they, they talked about the curves and they built little parks in the curves on the side of it. And then Avine said that, you know, the one facility that, that she owned and built, like she had several facilities, but apparently she sold them. But she said, you're amazed. She said, have any of you ever heard of pickleball? She said, because the parking lots all turn into pickleball tournaments every weekend. So we're looking for a place for the pickleballers and sycamores to go to. And, and it's kind of, it's kind of solved the problem with that. So, you know, um, I, I had some of the same concerns as everybody in this room, and after listening to that group today, I would like to wait till I see what they come back with before I make any hard, fast decisions. And as Councillor McCabe said, we could be totally not fiscally responsible and go out and buy some more dirt because the Habitat for Humanity showed up a month ago, and this project has been funded. 
and the Habitat for Humanity is basically a gift. And we don't have enough land to do it all on. And I think that we, we have to go to the taxpayer and say, hey, you know, we got to buy another million dollars worth of property so we can fit this. And the drawing that you're referring to, the one that was kind of circulated around town, the nice one with the glass windows and the kind of the V thing, that was some people that sat down and came up with a drawing of what they thought. It had never been proved out that it could be built. Uh, it was not, you know, it was just an idea. And so we're waiting to hear what the idea might be. And we were told today, we hopefully get it before Christmas. It's what they're working on. So I kind of would like to reserve my decision until I see exactly what they're going to do with that space see that drawing and steve if you've worked with these people one of my before. questions was what what is going to happen to the old doctor's office and all that property i think people are wanting to know that too uh in response councilman Mollies, i i totally agree with what you're saying i think we need time to digest this i used the blue cubicle building of three story square blocks as an example this is exactly what we're talking about no one in town knows what's going on yeah. We need the town hall. Oh, okay. I'm fully aware of what Mr. Gardner does, or what his designs are. Fully aware. Of it. As I said, very well versed with Scott Village in Alberta. And I'd like to point out uh, has anyone here ever worked with Habitat for Humanity before? Because I have extensively. I've built thousands of units of low cost or affordable power. Those two words, low cost and affordable, are grouped into one thing. What every single builder that I've worked for in building these buildings has jokingly said in the past is we're building the slums of tomorrow. We have to use caution if we're going to put affordable slash low cost housing into a downtown core of any community. I, we need growth here in this town. But I said it earlier, it's location based. I mean, there's other properties in this town that people have acquired over the last few years. I, I believe there's one in 97 South that was acquired from Sable Developments or something. Uh, you know, pretty good chunk, chunk of land. That's what I've heard. I don't know. But uh, there are other places that, in my opinion, are more logical, more desirable, or definitely affordable housing rather than the downtown core. And let's call it the Ewing Center today because that's what it's branded as. But no one really knows as to what the public doesn't know. That's that's the issue. I'm not against the building. I'm all for it. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> Interesting. So I guess we're heading for a town hall meeting, and maybe we'll have a little more details in as far as the design. Um, and uh, there is a serious situation here in Sycamus based on some conversations I've had recently. There is no housing here for young people. There's very little in Habitat for Humanity and I understand their concept because my daughter actually sits on the board in Kelowna and, and, uh, and uh, gave me the scoop on Habitat. It's actually a really good, it's a really good uh, uh, way in order to get affordable housing. When it comes to the management side of it, after the building is built, that's going to be the that's where the devil is in the details and how we're going to lay this thing out. What do we want? So what we're trying to do in the Sycamus is try to find some housing for young people to build up our workforce because right now all of the businesses in this community are really struggling and trying to get staff, whether it's a houseboat or whether you're working for a uh, or one of the restaurants, it's really difficult. I was uh, in an experience with, uh, at a function at Sycamus House Post here about a week ago when six young men came up to me and, and asked me about housing because they live in different communities, not in our community because they can't get a place to rent here. <laughs> so that's it, almost a catch 22. Now I understand the concerns. I understand Mary, your concern. You're asking what we might do with the current uh, medical center, but taking a picture out of other people's books, 
Chetwin was a prime example of this. They couldn't get a doctor in their community. So the community went out and they built a complex, okay, without, give, without any sort of confirmation with any medical professional at this particular stage. And after they built the complex, within a year, they had four doctors working in their community. You know, if we build a really nice medical clinic, and one of the things that we were looking at here uh, over the last four or five years, first off, six, seven years ago, we were just about to lose our elementary school. The Legion was going to close its doors, okay? Dr. Beach was ready to retire, and we didn't know what the owners of that building were going to do with that building at that particular, they just wanted to sell it. They could have sold it to just about anybody that might have put whatever into it. So we took the steps to buy that building in order to keep medical help here. Now we build a new clinic and now we have, and thanks for, to Dr. Connell right here, Carol, who sits in the gallery right now. She stepped up and she's now one of our doctors here. And now we have three doctors and now these doctors are looking forward to us building a medical clinic that's gonna be really something unique. So very difficult for council when we had all this land and how we were gonna allocate this and we got these different decisions to make. First off, we're trying to build up a workforce here. We're trying to get some affordable housing and rental housing and it's all about how we manage it. And then what is the most important thing that you got in your community? We were able to save the elementary school and we were able to keep it open and now the enrollment's going up. Now it's hard to even buy a house in Sycamus because there's building permits going on and whatnot. And now there's uh, all kinds of opportunity for maybe development and we might see maybe a few more stores because this habitat building isn't just about housing. The entire bottom floor of this is all commercial. Habitat has a different format now than what they used to have prior. Okay, they used to build single family housing, but because of the cost of land now, they're looking at these multi-purpose units now. This is part of their concept now. So when they came to us and they, um, they have a design, it was, I think uh, they're in the architectural stage of about $200,000 into it. And after we had a footprint here, well, we only had so much land. So where were we gonna put this thing? So yeah, it's, um, it's, it's been really, really tough for this council to make some decisions in order to build a, a workplace or a workforce in order to have a, some affordable housing for, for these younger people to maybe come in and live here. And also at the same time, this medical clinic, which is essential. And at the same time, if we have more young people, we're gonna fill our schools up, okay? And so it's a progression of thing, but until we get some housing here, you know, uh, we're basically at a standstill. So um, uh, there's just a lot of moving parts here. But what we have done is we've taken the the inventory that we've had in land and we're we're going to develop it. And that's kind of been what our decision was here. And we go ahead, Trevor, you have one more comment and then we got to move on Gord and then go ahead. It's Steve. Steve, sorry. Oh. <laughs> To reiterate what you said, I, I do agree, but I have a, a question. Is the format for Habitat still based on volunteer labor? It's not based on that. No, no but they, I've done a lot of projects with them and donated a lot of my time. And I've done things for Council of Forest Industries for the federal government, along with Habitat for Humanity. And I watched these projects, and it's a part of my concern. I'm retired. Historically, they go on on, 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 because it's all volunteer labor from within the community to build the commercial multi-family or the single-family home activities that I've been personally involved with. So that's a question. If it's not, you point, if it is, that would be a concern. Yeah. yeah. Well, I don't believe that this will be volunteer labor. I think that, you know. Historically, it has anything that I've participated in. Guess what? <laughs> Malcolm, you might have to take this. Okay. Board, go ahead. Yeah, through the chair, and I just want a little history on that 200 property, 200 Main Street property. Uh, it was originally purchased by Jack Bowers for uh, condominiums and commercial on the bottom bottom floor. 
<laughs> and and uh, we went out on a limb and purchased that property. And just to give you an idea, because a lot of people don't understand, if we don't have funds in a in a uh, nested in a equipment purchase or whatever it may be, land purchase pot, we have to go to the taxpayer. And for every forty six thousand dollars, it's a one percent tax increase for the taxpayer. So for us to buy a piece of property, we are really going out on a limb if we don't have the months money and we don't have any more money left in that land purchase pot. So just for Daryl to go out and buy a, a new truck off the cuff, if it's not budgeted for or in that uh, equipment uh, pot, uh, your taxes could go up 1% just for a truck that we purchase. So it, it, we, you know, we've thought about this long and hard. It's a difficult choice, but it's the opportunity right now. And, and that's what we're looking at. Yes, we do have to go to the public and have an uh, open house for sure. If I uh... Okay, I'll, I'll just take one more comment from Councillor Evans, and then we'll have to move on. Yeah, folks, this this is a uh, thank you. This is a brainstorm that we're going to be brainstorming this, and doing a good job on this, and do a good job of communicating clearly, transparently, and having public consultation. So this is nothing. None of this is a done deal. We're working on it, and as like Evan said earlier, we're going. We've heard loud and clear that uh, you guys need to know what's going on and we will make sure that happens. Um, bottom line is that we just want to make it. Um, I've got a friend who makes $50,000 a year. He'd love to move here to uh, open a full-time youth center. He, there's no place he can afford to buy. He could buy one of these units. We will make sure that we're communicating clearly with you guys. And uh, we, we love our town. We're going to do a good job of that. So that's just my last comment. Thank you, Councillor Evans. And we do commit to have a town hall for a greater conversation. Commit to that. Stick to that. We won't have it way, way down the road when your when your input doesn't matter. Uh, we're we're early in the process right now, so we will have a, a town hall meeting for a greater conversation and understanding, and we will listen to your input. So I'm going to move on now. There's no delegations, I don't think. <clears throat> Public statutory hearings, I don't think there's any. Unfinished business. Well, the galley might have a different opinion on that one, but <laughs> staff report. So we're to uh, 11A21 <clears throat> tax sales. Kelly, could we please hear from you? Yes, so very um, exciting topic after all that discussion. Um, this is just an update on the tax sale, which occurs the last uh, 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 last Monday of September every year. And this is when property owners have three years worth of delinquent taxes. Uh, then they go to tax sale um, in September. So as of the end of July, we have 23 uh, delinquent property owners and the finance department diligently uh, collected all of those. So we did not have a tax sale um, in September. Good. And happy to take any questions on that. All right, any comments or questions on the tax sale? Good. Yeah. Okay, thanks. All right, uh, we will move on. <clears throat> Sorry for the interruption there. Thank you, Malcolm, for stepping in for me. I was glad that there was a doctor in the house. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, uh, next, uh, 11B, reallocation of funds, Beach Park upgrades. Recommendation that council amend the 2021 financial plan bylaw to reallocate $100,000 of funding from Finlayson Park upgrades to the Beach Park upgrades with recreation capital projects. I need a mover on this. Councilor Bushell, Councilor Anderson. Okay, comments. Uh, in regards to that, Kelly, can you give us an update on that, please? Um, yes, most definitely. So the Beach Park Upgrades is a capital project, which you are all aware of. The total uh, budget for this uh, is 677000 is the total project budget. And this was uh, what we budgeted for in the grant application, because this is primarily funded via grants. Uh, to date, from last year and this year, we have spent $603,000. We, with approximately 150 remaining. This 150 is to pay the final draw to the contractor as well as to finish off with some up, upgraded play structure. So we're short about $75,000. 
The reason why is in the original budget, the archaeological works was budgeted for 36,000. And to date, we have actually spent $137,000. So we're over $100,000 over budget on archaeological work, which we really haven't had much control over. Uh, and so what staff is recommended recommending is reallocating and shifting some uh, capital project budget um, within recreation. So we do have $100,000 in our, our budget currently for turf upgrades at Finlayson Park. Uh, for various reasons, which, which Daryl can elaborate on if you, if you need to know, we're unable to complete that this year. So what I'm recommending is that we reallocate that $100,000 to the beach park. It really has a very nominal financial impact as it's just a reallocation of funds. And then we'll revisit uh, Finless and Park upgrades when we discuss the 2022 uh, capital budget. Okay, thanks, Kelly. Comments or questions on the resolution? I'm hearing none. I'm going to call a question. All those in favor, <coughs> unanimously. Thank you for that, Kelly. All right. Eagles Nest Storage signed Eagles Nest uh, lease. Uh, Second was Eagles 2021 20, 2022. Um, Daryl, you want to comment on this? Uh, sure. Through the chair. We have been asked to provide some kind of assistance for the hockey players that arrive back from games at night and with wet equipment, and they're unable to access the rec center with, with the current agreement. Uh, I haven't really drilled down to what that, the agreement is with the rec center, but I, I think it has to do with, with the safety issues surrounding uh, just the cooling system and all that. There were some accidents at, at, at an arena last year. So it's after hours and they're not wanting the hockey players to to go in unattended so that was done in the past this year they can't do that so they're coming home with wet equipment and it was asked of us if we could build them a mudroom on the end of that portable building which is not a feasible option in my opinion uh, what i what i did find was i got a quote on a sea can and Public Works would be willing to insulate it, drill a couple holes in it, bring in some conduit and some light, and maybe put a baseboard heater in there and tuck it beside the eagle's nest. Uh, it's something we could accomplish for probably about six thousand uh, dollars. But who's paying for that? That's why it's here. All right. Comments or questions? <laughs> All right. Go ahead, uh, Evan. Now, being a volunteer with the Eagles, I'm dismayed that once again, the current contract does not allow something that we had before. Under the old contract, we had a mudroom. We had a place for the kids to put their equipment under the old ownership model. Um, this is a class A tenant in a rec center that has no home to hang their equipment because the current contract and the current operator, which is privately run, is saying no. So now they're asking the taxpayers to come up with some funds so the kids can drive their equipment. Um, I, I just think that's so wrong. There is space available in the rec center. I play hockey. I know the rooms. It's available, but we're told under the current ownership and the contract, no, the kids are not allowed to hang their equipment. Very disappointing. And so now it's up to the taxpayer to find a place and, and, and Daryl and the crew to scramble to come up with an alternative. Um, if this sounds I'm bitter about the current contract and the current arrangement, yep. It's just not right for the community. You know, the, the Sycamus Eagles are a non-for-profit hockey team. You could buy the team for a buck, maybe 10 if you're lucky. It's not privately held. It's not assisting a business. They're non-for-profit. All they're trying to do is find a place to hang their equipment which they always have since 19, how long have the Eagles been? 1992? 1994. 1994. Why, why is this a problem today? Am I missing something, Jamie? Um, a lot of this, I think, Kevin actually comes from the safety community. Yeah. That's what they're telling me. Um, it has to do with that. It's not so much that the kids don't have a place to drive over here, pardon me, with the mask. Um, it's for when they re, uh, arrive after hours when they're on a road trip. So when they get at two o'clock in the morning because of staffing issues. So it's anytime after 10 p.m. 
if they return home from the away games. They can't get in the arena. That's too high in our, our yeah. Right. And lots of times when we do have an away game, we have a game the next day. So by the time we get into the arena, the kids are putting on a reservation. Right. <laughs> just just for conversation. <laughs> Colleen and then Gordon. Gordon was first. <laughs> Ladies first. Okay, to the chair. Uh, this is something, uh, I mean, this is the reason why we should have got the contract and not uh, an out-of-towner from Ontario. Um, I really do think that it's time to put the CSRD on notice and we we back out of our 260 grand we pay them every year and go ahead with this $6,000 purchase, but take it out of the 260 grand we give them every year. Like and maybe we take put them put them on notice and and uh, and and get out of our servicing agreement. But this is this this is, goes on forever. This year, so Colleen, go ahead. So I believe that there should be a conversation with the CSRD, but for right now, um, I think that <laughs> we shouldn't. <laughs> Um, uh, perhaps we could do a fundraiser. Perhaps we could uh, talk to some of the businesses in town. Maybe we can come together and see if we can get some cash to, to support, uh, you know, the $6,000. Just the thought. Mr. McCabe? Yeah, thank you, through the chair. I'm, I'm just wondering, um, through the chair to Evan, I guess, does staff have a recommendation of what we should do? I think I stated mine. <laughs> <laughs> in terms of a, a budget, I don't believe it's been budgeted for. No. It's not a big amount. Anyways, go ahead, Kelly. Yep. Yeah, no, it would just be funded from uh, taxation surplus. So, you know, we budget for things, some are up, some are down, taking a look at the numbers. Just because of COVID, there has been a few less operating expenditures. So there's there's room in our operating budget, assuming we do a resolution to support it. But because it's not... It's ours, but it's not something we are doing on our own. It would need a council resolution to support it. <clears throat> Councillor McCabe and then Councillor Mullis. Yeah, I wasn't too involved in the, the Eagle's Nest there, but I think after we hooked up, there was an issue about property and then about a power source, we had to share a power source. So if, and I'm, again, I don't know the details or anything, but if we put a can in there, is there going to be an issue about the type of amperage we currently have and where the power source would come from, or is that not an issue? Yeah. No, great question. We had that last year when we hooked it up. We, we have dealt with that. We we uh, actually met with the CSRD and they pay what they have to pay for and we pay our share. You know, folks, we made this happen. Can Daryl and the team put together a, a, a plan to house the equipment? Yes. Will it cost six thousand, seven thousand dollars to be funded by surplus? Of course. My comments are more editorial. I think it's just a shame that since 1994 we had an arrangement, it worked, and all of a sudden in the year 2021, with all due respect to COVID and all due respect to WorkSafe BC and all the rules and regulations that we're fighting, I just find it interesting that now it's being run by a for-profit company. We're not allowed access. I think that's a shame. Can we make it happen with our resources? Of course we can. Have you had this discussion with the CSRD? <clears throat> Jesus, I'm telling you, with a hair in the back of my neck standing up. Go ahead, Jeff. <laughs> Careful, you get another bleeding nose. Um, <laughs> <laughs> how much space do they need there? Like what size of seat can are you talking about? Through the chair, we're, We've currently rented one for some of the rec programs. It's just an eight footer. It's it's small, mm -hmm. but I, I think it would be sufficient if we put hangers a foot apart and three three walls on the inside. We'd get everything hung. So eight feet. Let's just get it done and six thousand six thousand dollar closet. I have a forty foot insulated container that I'm not using. I was growing tomatoes in it, but I'm not doing that. <laughs> It's, it's too far to drive from you. <laughs> no, it's 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 actually not even. It's one sitting out of twin anchors. It'd be picked up and moved, but it's a forty foot container. I wouldn't sell it. I'd let you borrow it, but and the intention that you'd go back and resolve this issue with the CSRD. They have to have a way 
their dressing room is basically got an entrance to the outside right there. Why can they not kind of put a wall thing or something in there that they can go in and use this thing? Um, maybe, <clears throat> Jamie, you, you elaborated on the WorkSafe BC issue. Maybe that's something we need to look into, Daryl. This is like, WorkSafe BC is, is the one pulling the strings here. Um, I know if you had to bring them in after hours, you'd probably pay more for the staff than you're paying for this eight foot trailer insulated. So, <laughs> just, but I mean, if it's an option, if you, if you think you can use it, uh, it's stainless steel inside. It's a, it's a C going insulated container already. So, but it's 40 feet. It's not. Yeah, through the chair, that's too big for the site. I think we should go ahead and find a solution for this, Daryl, and I think that, uh, and then we'll work with the CSRD when we uh, send our allocation of funding to them uh, next uh, January, less six thousand dollars. Anyway, yep. You know, go ahead. Thank you. Sir. So I'll make a motion because I think staff might need a resolution that uh, uh, we spend up to uh, I don't know. Maybe eight thousand in case it goes a little yeah. estimate. Uh, I make a motion that we direct staff to accommodate the hockey club with a, a seat can that can be used to dry their. Okay, yeah. thank you, Malcolm. Do I have a seconder, Councillor Aries? All right. Any more comments on this? Going to call the question. All in favor? Unanimously. Thank you. Thanks for that, Daryl. Oh, jeez. Oh, yeah. Section 219, Covenant Replacement, 800 Two Mile Road. Recommendation that the District of Sycamus authorize the discharge of Covenant LB201972 and replace it with a new covenant restricting development on Section 19 and 30, Township 21, Range 7, west of the 6th Meridian Kamloops Division, Yale District Plan KAP. 86301. Scott, before I ask for a mover and seconder, could you just give us a detailed uh, report on this? I can. Thank you, Chair. So this is uh, the Waterways Houseboats property. Um, and if council remembers, they issued a temporary use permit for a coverall structure and an ATCO trailer for staff accommodation. <laughs> um, so in order to that go forward, there's a covenant on the property right now that, uh, that doesn't allow that. It was put on in 2008 um, by the Ministry of Transportation. They wanted a traffic study done and uh, the District of Sycamus, um, where we required them to connect to water and sewer. Um, so in order to go forward, that covenant would have to be amended. Um, it was cleaner to just replace it with a new covenant. Water and sewer has been connected. So really the district interests are, are, are satisfied. Uh, Ministry of Transportation has agreed to allow this, the. Um, the coverall structure and the ATCO trailer to go forward um, by amending the covenant or replacing with that new covenant. Um, they are undergoing the traffic study right now. They're going through a rezoning right now. So it's kind of those bigger issues would be solved, but this will just allow them to go forward with uh, the development that that temporary use permit allowed. Okay, thank you. All right, can I get a mover on this? Councillor Evans seconded by Councillor Bushel. Any comments or questions on this? Okay, I'm gonna call the question. All those in favor? Carried unanimously. Thank you, Scott. All right, uh, Old Town Bay Marina Pub Liquor License Outdoor Patio Application. Again, you, uh, this is a fairly uh, long recommendation. Um, so can you give us a complete report on this and then we're, uh, we'll get a move in seconder on this. Certainly, right. thank you through the chair. Um, so Old Town Bay Marina has submitted an application to the Liquor and Cannabis Regulation Branch for the creation of an outdoor patio, patio area as part of their primary liquor license. If council recalls, you recently considered in May um, them moving their primary liquor license from 102 Martin Street to Old Town uh, Marina Bay. Um, and at that time, it didn't, uh, council did not feel it was necessary to do public consultation because no residential properties are within 800 meters of it, and that aligns with the liquor policy as well. And so we did recommend approval for the uh, liquor license to be moved to Old Town Bay Marina. It was um, accepted by the liquor uh, branch, and so now they would like to have a patio area, and the local government is required to comment. 
So you can choose not to comment, and that puts the onus on uh, basically the property owner to conduct that public consultation. Um, or you can choose to uh, um, proceed with expecting our own public consultation if we'd like, and that would require us putting out ads, um, notices, and whatnot. Um, or you can choose to align with the liquor policy and just say, listen, it's nowhere near any residential properties. We're fine with it and let the liquor uh, board continue with the application. So three options for you tonight. And if you have any questions on that, uh, please let me know. All right. Councillor Vaughn, let's go ahead. So um, they currently have a building and a restaurant and the bathrooms there are all good and the, the patio with the tables and it's a walk up to the window bar. I've been there, I've had a beer and a hamburger. And um, so are they asking for where they got the picnic benches as an addition? It looks like there's a patio one and a patio two, and it's going to be 42 seats in total. Well, um, there's there's 40 seats on the existing patio. I can't speak to their current operations. I can only speak to what I saw through the application that was submitted to the liquor uh, board, and that was forwarded to us. So these are additional because those tables aren't there currently or they weren't there this summer so they plan on using those tables and no no control area because that's where the the public access their houseboats the public access is the dock for the boat lodge the public is continually going through that area and, and it's completely wide open i don't know maybe, maybe they should can do their own Consultation. Councillor McCabe, go ahead. So I see staff is recommending approval. Um, my question is for patio one. In the picture there, if we could please bring that up, Kelly. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, patio one seems like it has a bit of a steep bank on two sides there. It's it's taped with yellow tape and everything, but if you're gonna have people drinking and then they get up and that bench doesn't look too far from that fairly steep bank, and Councillor Mama suggested that's where folks go down to um, access the boats and stuff. So there's a path between patio one and and the bar, if you will, where anybody can walk, miners or um, any customers of uh, twenty acres, and you don't have to be uh, uh, be renting a boat to come there and sit in this proposed patio one. So I think if we staff's recommending approval, I think if council does approve it, I think there's a safety issue there in patio one that uh, those two uh, two sides should be fenced off. So that way it's isolated from the general public and there's not that big drop when you're having a beer and you go to use the washroom or go to grab another beer and it doesn't look very safe. Okay. Jan, go ahead. Um, and to clarify, uh, when council considers whether or not they would recommend uh, that the liquor board approve this, the liquor board would review all of that. They're, they're, um, council's considering what is the impact of noise on the community, uh, what is the general impact on the community as a whole, and the views of residents in the nearby area that would have concerns. And that's why um, staff at this point say, you know, the nearest resident is 800 meters away. We really don't think that the noise, we look at the zoning of that location, and so we don't, they already have the liquor license there. And so uh, staff don't see that it would cause much concern in terms of noise or resident impact by allowing it. But certainly the liquor board would be reviewing all of those concerns that you brought up. And even if we did recommend approval, the liquor board could still deny it based on, on a lot of those considerations. So yeah. thank you. So um, what's taken place since COVID, um, the the uh, liquor control branch has um, expanded the possibilities of um, outdoor patios. And uh, I know uh, the Eagle River Golf Course 
is looking at about 10,000 square feet of additional patio. They're encouraging people to sit out in a patio more so than inside because of COVID. So they've, they've relaxed those uh, regulations. And so I'm in support of, of supporting staff recommendations on this. Uh, it'll still be up to the, uh, the uh, liquor control branch in order to, uh, to actually uh, uh, support this. So it's up to them. So uh, any other comments or questions on this? Okay, I'm gonna call the question, go, go ahead. Um, I'm gonna refrain from voting on this as I am an employee of Old Town Bay Marina. <clears throat> so Colleen's in conflict. I'm still, you don't have to leave Colleen, I'll just call the question. All those in favor? Carrie, thank you. Thanks for that, Colleen. Okay. Uh, Request for letter of support for the Italic. Is that how you pronounce it? Okay. Festival 2022 recommendation of council for a letter of support for the Italic festival proposed for September 30th, 2022. All right, Jamie, give us a report on this, then I'll get a mover and seconder. Thank you, student chair. Good evening, everyone. Um, I am very excited to come forward today to ask Council for a letter of support in a proposed uh, new festival that we would like to work with vaccine on for our Truth and Reconciliation Day for 2022. A year we in now, it seems like a letter. Um, we know that in the past, the Congress has had a definite um, um, grip on events. We've become the place that people know that we do events and we do events well. However, with the downshift of COVID and for the last two summer not being able to host any events, I'm really concerned that we may have lost some of the momentum that we had in things like our, what was going to be our Guts and Glory game and some of the other festivals that we're putting on. So it has been announced by the provincial government that they are investing into communities, realizing that some of these economic drivers, especially in the tourism field, have been lost. And so they have put forward a fund which is called the BC Fairs and Festivals a event recovery um, fund. So ourselves, the District of Sigma is in partnership with Spotsing. I've been working with Kyle Crump, uh, she and jo or Sean Johansson, myself. Um, we put together an application for a tune of uh, request of $5,000 because they are willing to support up to 20% or up to 20 of your grant application. So what we are looking to do is to put together a traditional authentic First Nations Truth and Reconciliation Day at the Sycamore Beach Park for 2022. Um, we've had lots of consultation back and forth between the group, and what we have decided to do is put forward a formal committee that will work on this event for the upcoming year. We had talked about hopefully putting something together shortly um, for this year of 2021. And of course, then of course, COVID started into our fourth wave. All of our rugs were pulled out from underneath us, so we decided that we wanted to take the time do this properly and as authentically as we possibly could. So the word he called, thanks to Scott's advice, I went on to the Shuaknik um, First Nations Language Dictionary. And the word he called, as you have seen here, means to come to a community for a party or a feast. And that's exactly what we're proposing. So we will be working with some of the elders for the spot scene. We have asked Carly to come on board and be a part of our committee. We will ask the, the Chamber of Commerce and the Visitor Center to become a part of this. And just recently today, I've just had an informal introduction with uh, Chelsea Jones, who is the new tourism director for Splatsing as well. And our hope is that once um, Kyle returns from his honeymoon, that this committee will start putting together what an event will look like for next year. So what we are looking at forming for next year will be on Truth and Reconciliation Day on September 30th. We will invite the other bands from the nation to come in and to share their traditions. We will focus on storytelling. We will focus on games. We will focus on friendships. We will focus on everything that is mainly on unceded territories of what we would call, or what Slatsin calls, sick lumps. So what I'm here today to ask council for is a letter of support that we can attach to our application in regards to moving forward with the Eagle Festival for 2022. All right, thank you. Okay, so there's a recommendation that council provide a letter of support for the Catalic Festival proposed for September 30th, 2022. Do I have a mover on this? Councillor Bushel, Councillor Aries, 
Any comments or questions for Jamie on this? We call a question. All those in favor? Carried unanimously. Thanks, Jamie, for that. <laughs> okay, street naming amendment bylaw number 1012 2021 adoption. Recommendation that the street naming amendment bylaw number 1012 2021 be adopted as presented this 13th day of October 2021. I need a mover on this. Councillor Malma, second by Councillor Aries. Any comments or questions on this? All right, call the question. All those in favor? Carried unanimously. Thank you. All right, animal control bylaw number 1013, first reading. Recommendation that animal control bylaw number 1013, 2021, be given first reading this 13th day of October 2021. I need a mover on this. Councillor Malma, second by Councillor Bushel, Jen, can you give us an update on this so we know already? Uh, certainly. So uh, at the June 9th uh, regular council meeting, staff were directed to make recommendations on the existing dog control bylaw, um, specifically uh, addressing the number of dogs, uh, the un unattended dog vehicles, uh, mandatory identification tags, and restrictions for dangerous dogs. Um, so I know it is getting late tonight, but I, if you wouldn't mind bearing with me, I do want to go over a few things that are in this bylaw and how it differs. Um, and uh, I did recommend only first reading because what I'd like to do is some public consultation on this. People do love their critters. People also do not love critters. And so it can be very controversial. And so uh, let's go out and see what do people think and is this the direction, but I would love to hear from council about what, what you're kind of envisioning for what this would be. So uh, the current dog control bylaw has presented limitations to the bylaw enforcement officer and he is here tonight and can answer any questions in promoting civic responsibility of domestic animals in general. So our bylaw does address dogs and it's got some, you know, don't take dogs uh, off leash and don't take them in the, um, in the beach and in the, in the lakes. Uh, and there's uh, no vicious dogs, but that's a difficult clause to enforce. Um, and so what the bylaw has been presented um, looks to just address a few of those things. So one, uh, council may wish to, uh, well, what's been presented is actually uh, includes language for animal and responsible animal ownership, so not just dogs. Um, and so that would be promoting the civic responsibility um, and giving some language uh, that would allow the bylaw officer discretion to determine what's a nuisance. So if somebody sees a cat scurrying across the property, is that actually a nuisance? Is that impacting or interfering with their rest and enjoyment of their property versus maybe the, the neighbor's rabbit is coming over and eating their lettuce? right? That could be more of a nuisance, right? And so it would give that discretion to the bylaw enforcement officer to determine how much of their rest and enjoyment and convenience of their property being impacted. And that it would um, produce uh, there's some fines for if your animal is creating a nuisance on somebody else's property and they're not taking care of your animal. Um, there's also, uh, but uh, council may wish to narrow the scope and just have it just to dogs. So if that is direction I'm looking from council, if you want it to be just dog specific, or would you like to have this idea of responsible animal ownership. Um, this would be initiated on a complaint basis only. We're not sending John out to go hunt down bad animal owners where he would uh, wait for complaints to come in from, from neighbors in the, in the community, or if he was out in the course of his duties and saw a dog running around, he would go um, you know, enforce file on that. Um, so there with me, I've got a few that I wanna go over. Um, so, so section 10, specifically on that nuisance, it's that an owner must ensure their animal does not unreasonably disturb the peace, rest, uh, and enjoyment of individuals in the community. And that word there is unreasonably and what's unreasonable. Um, additionally, we, uh, of course, the philosophy for bio enforcement, and I say this, I swear, every time I talk about it, is that we look for voluntary compliance. We look through education. It's not always through um, you know, those heavier tools like fines, but of course some fines have, some fine um, numbers have been presented in this bylaw that um, if uh, education and conversations weren't getting that compliance, we could um, issue tickets through some fines. Um, there's also, when it comes to dogs, this introduces a maximum of three dogs per household. I arbitrarily picked that number, three. I don't know if council feels that's appropriate, if they put it higher, if they want it lower. Um, if you want to wait to see what the public thinks about three dogs per household, um, of course, there'd be um, exemptions for that. You know, if you have a pet sales business, uh, a groomer, a vet clinic, kennel or breeder. Um, and then when it comes to dangerous dogs, our current bylaw says that there are, we just must not harbor a vicious dog and that the definition just says that a vicious dog is one that is injured, like without provocation has caused injury. That's difficult to prove and difficult to enforce. 
And so the language that's in this would, um, one, the community charity already, already provides provisions for uh, dangerous dogs. And if it seriously injures a person, um, a by law enforcement officer could seek to have that animal destroyed. But the language in here, because it's such a gray matter when it comes to, to dogs that maybe have shown aggression, would allow John to assess each situation as it comes and pre um, prepare maybe a safety management plan for that dog. Maybe it's, they must have a muzzle, maybe you must have a sign up that says warning dangerous dog on property and work with each situation as it comes. And it might be a situation where it does need to escalate where you cannot keep the dog, but maybe it's one where there was this, once the story comes out, this dog is maybe not a fully dangerous dog and there's there could be some a safety management plan. So that's a very quick, fast talking summary of what's presented before you. Um, I would love questions from council and some direction on what you think. And then of course I am recommending that we do some public consultation on this. Councilor Mullen, let's go ahead. Uh, I agree with what you have in here. Um, I, I do think you might want to consider taken specific to dog and have it under animal. Um, the uh, the three or more animals, um, that would be the public consultation. Um, I do know that I've seen some places with seven, eight, 10 animals and they didn't look after any of them. So, um, I don't know if it's just the number or just the individual that was, whether they would have had three dogs or whatever. There's three or four instances that are not necessarily in this community, but nearby here of, of that. And so um, I used to have dogs. I, I wanted to travel, so I don't have dogs that they, they restrict you. So um, Malcolm has a dog. He probably be better to comment on I don't know about this number thing. What if your kid's raising gerbils? <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Malcolm. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Councillor Mullen. Thank you, through the chair. Yeah, I, Carol. You know, I have I have Buddy. Uh, he sneaks out once in a while. I try my best to contain him. He's getting better at trained, but <laughs> yeah, I have a problem telling people how many animals they can have. It sort of sounds like a dictatorship so this is only first reading um i agree with councillor mamas let's take it to the public and and see what they say i like all the other language you have uh, i'm just um I, I think let's first reading is nothing etched in stone it just takes it to the public for consultation let's see what the public has to say about how many dogs or how many animals or how that's phrased yeah some people have three dogs and they're fine. Some people have five, they're fine. It, it depends on the owner, not, not the amount of animals, I think, personally, but it's my personal opinion. So I support passing this as, 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 a, as a first reading because that'll trigger public consultation. We'll get feedback from the public. Go ahead, Colby. I agree with animals post to dog as well. It shouldn't just be specific to dogs. Uh, just to confirm, you mean the number per household, or just um, that language that it's like responsible animal ownership, and that there's um, like any animal could create a nuisance rather than just a dog? Yeah. Okay. That's what I was referring to. Okay, not the limiting of the animals to a house. No. Okay. Councilor Bushel. Yeah, Jen, I agree. It's first reading, and uh, really good job putting that all together. Thanks for doing your homework, <coughs> or thanks for doing our homework. <laughs> Can I, I just, to, when? so right now it's sitting at three animals, three dogs, dogs. there's um, a section that's uh, for all animals in general, and then there's a dog specific, and then, okay, thank you. The dog bylaw came forward to SRD, and um, uh, it went through first, second, and third reading. It became quite controversial, uh, especially out in Falkland where they were having some dangerous dogs and, and uh, uh, but anyway, it uh, was resolved and the resolution was passed and they did change the bylaw and uh, I think was for the better. So based on public consultation. All right, so I'm gonna call the question. Did I ask for a motion? Oh, yeah, we did. Um, 
uh, Councillor Malmes and uh, Councillor Bush. Okay. Ooh, but, yeah. giant thing, but, uh, All those in favor? Okay, are you? Including Councillor McCabe. Good. <laughs> but he won't. <laughs> We're down to correspondence, all right. Uh, so uh, regarding the um, Shushwap, Columbia Shushwap Invasive Species Society recommendation that council appoint Councillor uh, Anderson to Columbia Shushwap Invasive Species Society. <laughs> as much as I would love. <laughs> to be on another committee. Obviously, I, she doesn't want to do this. So I understand that the, um, I understand you're thinking of quagga mussels and zebra mussels. This isn't just about that. That's why Joe was on it before. It's about the weeds and the, oh, yeah, so I, I would recommend that Jeremy, Shootsy, <laughs> be on the, uh, the committee. So does anybody that, that counselor, Jeremy, that we should, uh, we're looking for someone to step up. Um, this is just more involved than what you might know because uh, there's some serious problems with uh, invasive plant species, especially burdock, which is really starting to grow just across from the wastewater treatment plant. And uh, but uh, this particular uh, organization is really good to work with. So um, I was involved with it, but I have too much on my plate. Councillor Aries, are you interested in stepping up on and helping out with this? I was just looking at their meeting dates. Thank you for asking. Uh, uh, through the chair, I, yeah, I would take that on. You, hmm? you would, I could do it, yes. You would like to do it? I've, I'd, I'd note that with uh, elections only a year away, I can see why Colleen would be looking for a staff member to do it in a more long-term position. Colleen, go ahead. I would still recommend a staff member. It's really important that staff is looking after this and they're gonna find this stuff. So I recommend staff member. Yeah, well, I think staff works on it anyway, so. They are requesting a staff member. Hmm? They're requesting a staff member when you read the request. Oh, there you are? Yes, they would like to replace with a new staff member. Okay. Well, who are we going to put on this? Through the, through the chair. Through the chair, we'll, we'll get somebody from operations engineering. Okay. Good Everett. We we'll just leave it. Not Everett, no. <laughs> well, I, I already recommended Jeremy. Jeremy, what's Jeremy's last name? Fitzy. Fitzy. Yeah, but I... But, uh, we should just leave it to staff. We Let's just <clears throat> recommend that we need somebody to represent us, and we leave it to staff for who that is. Okay. Okay. Uh, on. So the recommendation that staff appoint <clears throat> someone to the Columbia Shooter rather than council, because that's the way the resolution reads right now. Oh, yeah. So go ahead, Jeff. Uh, through the chair, yeah, no, and uh, whoever the staff member is should have a bit of knowledge about what this is through the chair well, i'll make sure between jeremy and myself those meetings are attended we've both got some experience okay so let's rewrite this resolution uh, that council will appoint a staff member to the columbia issue shop and basic species society okay. board moved by councillor mccabe seconded by councillor aries all in favor carry Correspondence. Uh, we've got a list of correspondence here. Um, we've got City of Langley, <clears throat> Youth Parliament of BC, Margaret McDermott, twice Mayor for Peace, and Kathy Peters, BC Anti Human Trafficking. Does council? Councillors want to speak on any of these at the stage, Councillor McCabe and Councillor Bushel. Uh, we, we have two letters from uh, Margaret, and I see Margaret's in the galley, so maybe Margaret might want to speak to her. Sure. Yeah, I see the um, the letter in regards to uh, your concerns are around uh, uh,
Okay. Yeah, Mr. Amlin, uh, go ahead, Mark. You have the floor if you can give us your take. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, yes, I was kind of a little bit disgusted with Mr. Amlin. So, I decided to counteract that. And uh, I just appreciate what you guys are doing. And also, regarding the other letter, just regarding the passport, I kind of wrote that because I heard through the rumors that council was going to do something. And so, I thought I'd just address it. Um, I realize you're in a hard spot. So it's just something to be considered if you do get to the place where you have a position. Mr. Mayor had responded to that with me in a letter, uh, just saying that you, you know, your intentions and that you do go by the health records and the instructions are coming out. So I understand that. It's just to be considered if there's a place where you can make a decision or you can make a difference on behalf of those that are coming from that direction or are not at peace with it. And um, yeah, other than that, thank you for what you do. Thank you. All right, thank you. Does anybody have any comments or questions? Go ahead, uh, Evan. Well, being that I was the recipient of, of the comments, I did appreciate the letter. So I just want to personally thank you. Um, what you wrote. Um, as much as I seem to be the center of attention that evening, I thought the comments directed to Councillor Ari and Councillor McKayev were insulting at best. I think you addressed that, so thank you. All right, any other comments or questions? Thank you for those letters, Margaret. That's really helpful. Okay, so um, any other comments or questions on any of the other uh, correspondence at this particular stage. Hearing anything from counselors, I'm not going to comment any of these, so that's good. Um, wow. Recommendation at the regular council meeting for October 13th, 2021 be adjourned. Councillor Malmas, Councillor Aries, all in favor. Thanks to the gallery. Thank you very much. You're welcome. 